spin and tell kind of a funny story. Um, Hell yeah. Childhood okay. stories. Um, so it's kind of like, so, you know, I, I was a kid, very skeptical, logical kind of personality, you know, just how I am. And um, I remember like uh, the tooth fairy, right? So oh, I, yeah. I would lose a tooth and show my parents and then I'd be like, you know, put it under my pillow and then they'd give me like a quarter or something. Right. That's normal. But one time I was like, all right, I'm going to prove that the tooth fairy doesn't exist. I think I was like five years old. So I lost a tooth and I didn't tell my parents about it. I just put it under my pillow without even telling them. And uh, yeah, of course they didn't find it. Of course it wasn't replaced, but uh, I just think <laughs> I'm just I was remembering that story and I wanted to share it. I think That's I did all. the same thing. I did oh. the same thing, but it was like the reason for my skepticism was provoked by like the one of the first teeth that I lost. Like I ended up swallowing, you know, because like oh, you know what I mean. So I didn't like have it. I lost it, but it was like I like I was doing some shit. I think I got hit in the face with a ball or something. And like I, I ended up swallowing the tooth, so like I didn't have it, and I was like, "Oh, now I can't get anything from the tooth fairy." And I was like, "Oh, well, just like put like a note or something explaining that uh, under the thing." And I got money, and I was like, "This is a little sus." So the next time I lost the tooth, I did the same thing. But yeah, I, so I was like, "Whatever." But then that's another thing where I was like, "Well, I want this to keep going because this is my only source of income right now as a child. <laughs> like, this is this is the only." <laughs> This is the only way I can make money is is by losing teeth. Like, you know, if it's not birthday or Christmas, my only source of revenue right now is teeth. So I got to well, keep it backfire. <laughs> can't I can't let let on that. I don't know. I need the, this uh, this money so I can buy airheads. Uh, I think I, I vaguely remember also asking the tooth fairy for twenty dollars, which was. <laughs> I don't know how I did it. I think I just <laughs> tried to negotiate with the tooth fairy in a way. Like, I don't, I don't remember. You were going on strike. You're like, I'm withholding yeah. my teeth. <laughs> yeah. What's really creepy. Like, do you know, do you, there are like parents who like keep all of like baby, the baby teeth. That is like really disturbing ooh. to me. That's like voodoo magic to me, but it's like, what do they, what do they do with them? You get these teeth. I don't know. That's like a weird mom thing. Some moms like with those like collect. They have like the like keep like baby hair and shit like that. It's like the people who keep their placenta. I don't know. Weird shit. Holding on to baby teeth, put them in a jar. Not, yeah, not no. A my family, um, you know, it's like my grandma. She's she ha- she is this like guru person in a way. It's kind of it's weird. Like you, this hip, you know these hippies. Grandma? Yeah, uh, yeah, and she has this philosophy in life that she's imposed on the whole family, which is like, no, like you got, you're all gonna be dust. Like, don't save anything. Just live your life you're well alive. and just let it all go. Yeah, and and you know, it's funny because one time she got really angry at me because I was talking about how I think in the future people are just gonna put on like a headset or something and just record their whole life. You know, yeah, like, like that everything Black episode. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, I didn't even see that one, but like you know, it's just this uh, common idea, I guess. And um, she, you know, she just she she freaked out when when I said that. She's like, nobody's ever going to watch that footage. Nobody gives a shit. Nobody cares about like you in in the future. You know, just you know, stop stop thinking you're some eternal thing. Like, just give up on it. And she got really really angry over it, and it, I I was surprised by that, but. You know. I feel like that might be like a generational thing because, like, with the onset of like camcorders and like you know uh, the wider proliferation of like taking a ton of pictures and shit like that, like um, I feel like maybe some of the older people are like, oh, like it'd be I don't know, like I've seen this, uh, like there's there's piles and piles of photos and like VHS tapes of like you know tons of shit um, from my childhood. We have all these home videos, et cetera. And no one ever wants, no, you don't know, you don't want to watch that shit. Like, no one's, you know, like, you, you don't want to, yeah, no, for real. It. It's, it's not that interesting. And um, it's kind of weird uh, to, like, have it all. It's almost like, you know, it sort of, like, ruins even, like, your memory, uh, your, your impression of it, just like um, in your memory, if you just have these, uh, these uh, video recordings of all this shit. Like, I don't need a video recording of like me playing saxophone in fifth grade or something. You know what I mean? Like it's of no interest to me, but yeah, 
Yeah, now we've got our digital lives. Like, it's like that times a thousand, you know? I don't even know what to make of it. Well, you I remember know? when Twitter first um, came out, I was in high school still, way, way back in the day. And uh, I remember teachers being, like, very mad about the idea of Twitter. People being like, why would anyone care about, like, we were thoughts or whatever? You know what I mean? Like, why would you ever, like, tweet, tweet <laughs> yeah. anything? Like, what? no one cares. And then it's just kind of like, they were just so wrong about all of that. Uh, I just remember like adults being uh, my, my experience as a child anyway, was realizing that like all of the adults, like going through this like phase shift in technology were like basically wrong about everything more so than they were right about things. Like pretty much all the advice, like it was just like a, like, I feel like that's what, like why the generational gap is like um, so much like resentment in, in part is because it's like a, as a, a, a big part of like growing up as a millennial uh, in in America was just being lied to about how the world worked, how all this stuff worked, what was important, what was, it'd be like, you know, I remember like people being like, you can't play video games as a job. And it's like, well, actually a ton of people do that. Right. Like a ton of people play video games as a job. Like it's a mat. It's like more of a sure thing than if it was like, you should get a real, you should get like, you know, go into do something productive, like be a public school teacher or something. It's like, well, you probably would have made more money if you were just Twitch streaming the whole time. Yeah, or, or maybe like testing or something, but yeah, yeah, it's like yeah, if there's the demand for it, right? Um, it just there's been this you know, massive and, change in in how everything works. There's like you know Twitter that'll never be anything. And yeah, like, oh, well, it actually is like a very big thing, like all of social media. Yeah, and, and uh, you you can kind of classify like all like kind of boomers or even Gen Xers into two categories based on whether or not they've submitted to like the new digital era. Um, you know, it's like, yeah. do you have a smartphone? You know, do you, do you actually use it? That kind of thing. And uh, it is crazy to me to see like these old people that are starting to get ADHD kind of just from using these devices. Like I straight up talking to my mom the other day, she looks at her phone and immediately brings up something else. And I'm like, what? You, what like yeah, that's not that's not normal yeah. like that's not what humans are supposed to be like i, I just you know? think of like and, all of the the people who are like video games will rot your brain when i was a kid and now they're all addicted to like these fucking garbage iphone games and i'm just like jesus christ like i was playing fucking like actually good games too like realistically like as a kid like the games that i wanted to play were like far less harmful than the ones that you're playing now as an old boomer well, yeah, I mean, I, I guess there's different types of rot here, you know, like you get like the, all the GTA generation, you know, well, like I remember I all GTA. my friends. Yeah, I loved GTA. Yeah. And, and yeah, it's I, I never played it as a kid because my parents were, were kind of strict, you know, they were Nintendo people. But, you know, like I remember all my friends were just obsessed with all these like games intended for adults. And one of them like even was like telling me like oh yeah and you can totally like go to a strip club in this game this is like a 13 year old yeah, kid dude, telling me this dude, you know I grew up, so i grew up in a kind of like white trash town like straight up like mostly like it's part of a district which is more like has a class bifurcation between like the commuters who are working in some sort of like fire sector thing and then there's like the more like this is a place where people are commuting but they're commuting with like their work trucks to do like construction or like you know sort of more blue collar stuff and like that's sort of the mix of people. And this was one of more of like the blue collar focused towns. Um, so those like the blue collar parents are the more, more so the ones being like, yeah, you can play Grand Theft Auto or whatever, because like they didn't give a fuck, you know, one way or the other. Um, and like, you know, they listened to like heavy metal and shit like that. It was like kids listening to, you know, going to go see uh, uh, horror movies and whatever. And like, so those are the kids I grew up with. Like I had a strict household, but I could always just go to my friend's house and play GTA. I could like, I would walk through the woods and go play rated M games. And I had to, like, sort of maintain this, like, notion, like, oh, yeah, I'm allowed to do that. Like, if their parents ever asked, and I would, like, try to, like, maintain, like not let on that I was doing, I was, like, breaking the rules or whatever, you know? So, like, we had, having, like, the more lenient household nearby, like, I was like, yeah, I watch South Park there. I play Halo there. I play Grand Theft Auto there. At my house, we play Mario Kart, you know what I'm saying? Like, when we go to the video rental store, wow, video rental, um, <laughs> just thinking about that brings so many Jeez. memories to my mind. Um, it would be like, like with a set, like I, I watched dogma, like in elementary school, like the Kevin Smith movie, 
um at my friend at this friend's house also because like his parents would let us take out like rated r movies and shit like that so like i don't know i always found that to be like that sort of stuff to be weird like the uh age restrictions and things because like i was a very like precocious little kid and i mostly had friends who were older i think it's because i was socialized a lot with like my cousins who were like mostly older than me so like the idea of like hanging out with kids that were like three years older than me wasn't like unheard of like i got used to get invited to like in elementary school to birth like i was in like third grade and going to like sixth graders birthday party like being the only one of that age i was kind of like the pet little kid of um the older boys in uh my my neighborhood so i was like yeah i want to like do the grown-up things or whatever like i want to play rated m games and like you know do all this stuff and uh i always thought it was funny also because like those restrictions don't exist for books right where it's like if you have books if you're reading books like there's not like oh like here's a rated r book right for kids like no one's ever like deciding which books are like you know like i guess you could say like young adult fiction or whatever there's these like sort of fake things but there isn't like a rating uh regime for books so as a kid well i would read like yeah. books for adults and it would have all of this stuff like i remember like i read a clockwork orange and i was like why can't i watch the movie i read the book and it's like well the movie is like rated r and it's like well i read the book though like i've already read the book like there's not you know what i mean so like that those that was always what was going through my head i don't think it like fucked me up too much or whatever but like this is also like early internet days, like E-bombs world and stuff like that was like one of my earliest introductions because it was like kids, older brothers being like, hey, check out this website, et cetera. Um, so like I saw a super fucked up stuff on the internet when I was like really young and I just like considered that kind of normal. Um, I don't know if that's good or not. I don't, I'm not saying this is like something that sh- is like I would recommend or whatever, but uh, I, I don't, I, I, I always felt like uh like I didn't I don't think that like playing Grand Theft Auto fucked me up in any way as a kid. Like I knew it was like a joke it was like a game, you know, that it was like it's like, you know, it's not real. Like it's just like it's just fucking around. You know, and it's like as kids we like as kids we used to fuck around in the same way. Like you don't take like violence seriously as a kid because it's a game. Like you're like, Oh, like we're so like you know, we're we're pretending to shoot each other, like in the woods. Like what's the difference between that and like playing Grand Theft Auto? I don't really know. Yeah, I I don't know. I mean, I've definitely, you know, talked to different kids now as an adult, like, you know, some of my friends have kids now and, you know, it's still crazy to me. But like um, some kids are genuinely um, very sensitive to this kind of thing. Um, You know, I I was talking to a kid he was like seven years old or something. And what's really funny is like his best friend is fucking hilarious. Um, You know, also a kid, of course. He loves Russia. He's like a That's he's like, like this overly online yeah. kid who yeah he fucking loves Russia and it's like it's <laughs> he doesn't like China oh, you know yeah. but uh, anyway uh, yeah but he's on the yeah anyway and part of the, the Russia yeah he's he's like maybe that's what it is but he's like obsessed with like eastern europe and russia and like the former communist countries of europe and all this stuff and military history and all this and he want he he wanted to make a video game with me and he's like wanting to make like this like real time strategy game with me he's like can you can you program this like you're a programmer um but like his friend was like this like little like disturbed kid who's just like telling me like I don't know if this is okay. Like this, he's he, he, he's promoting something. It sounds like like the Holocaust. It's just really scary. Like his like his like super sensitive friend with the total opposite personality. Yeah, like terrified of him. Like, you know they do fucked up stuff too at the sleepover party. Like this kid's a pussy. Like he won't watch the movie. Like he's you know uh, it's rough. It's rough to be that kid. Uh, yeah no it's crazy like the stuff i see these kids doing and thinking and i mean i i dude i don't know, I, I can't even I, describe as a little it kid like we watched jackass and like my my idea of fun with my friends was like we're gonna make our own jackass and like do stupid fucked up stuff to each other i don't know it was like what we did uh that was fun for me i don't know like i, I, don't know, I grew up with kind of white trashy kids i'm not gonna lie like you like uh i just took a lot of this stuff for granted it was kind of it's kind of funny because it's like not really the class background of like my uh family at large 
So like when my like because the rest of my family is like more like professional like knowledge corridor type people, you know, college like it's not like I'm like the first generation I went to college or whatever. Um, and even like uh, when it comes to like immigration or whatever, the Irish side of my family didn't immigrate from poor Irish stock. They were part of like the Irish like elite of the time who came over. Um, so I, I so like I was kind of like uh, like treated like. Um, I still am sort of treated as like the country bumpkin of the uh, the extended family because I was mostly socialized like with, you know, kids who wanted to go dirt biking and stuff like that and like go hunting and things like that. And that has like no connection whatsoever to the vast majority of my family. Okay, yeah, this shit's all adding up to me now. Like there's something about Irish people like they just go hard. I don't know how else to say it. Like, well, there's two types of I don't Irish. Know, uh, Irish guys, there's two types of Irish. Right? Yeah, there's, there's called what it was used to be called the lace curtain Irish. Right. And these are like the Irish who are like sort of um like they're like the upper middle class Irish who are like trying to be like extremely civilized and like being like, we're just as good as the genteel, like British, et cetera. Like we're equal on that level. Like we're just as fancy, et cetera. You can sort of see this if you watch, um, uh, I highly recommend this as a Christmas thing in general, James Joyce's the dead, but there's also a film adaptation of the dead, which is actually really, really well done. And it's all about going to like a Christmas party at like a, like kind of lace curtain, Irish, uh, Christmas, uh, festivities is on the, the setting and it does a really good job of showing it. Um, so it's like, you have this sort of genteel Irish, the lace curtain Irish, um, and they distinguish themselves very much from what they call the shanty Irish, which were like the uh, the lower class Irish um, who lived in, you know, they were the shanty Irish. Um, that's why you can wear the word like shanty, like shanty town and things like this all come from. So that class anxiety exists and uh, the bifurcation exists within like the Irish uh, diaspora or however you want to put it. Um, Definitely more of the lace. Like I found out stuff about like my grandma and like my great grandparents, like much later in life. Like my grandma, like used to go to like parties in Manhattan where like Frank Sinatra was and things like that. Like I never knew that she never knew how to drive. She never got a driver's license ever her whole life because like, why would she drive? You know, she was like very, very, um, very, uh, genteel. Like, you know, like uh, to, to see like driving your own car, like as a woman to being sort of like a, like a shanty thing to do. I don't know. Weird stuff. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I've got like this crazy mixed heritage. Uh, it's just, I don't I can't, nobody can make sense of it. It's <laughs> some combination of Irish, German, Pakistani, Russian, and uh, Canadian. Um, just all like thrown together. So I'm just, it, it's liberal, you know, liberal grandma, you know, marries a Pakistani man and uh, the one I was talking about. And then it all just kind of comes down to America from there. But like, uh, yeah, so I can't, I cannot make sense of myself in that way at all. I, do, I, I love learning about it's like different types of people. You know that kind of thing, but I can't make yeah, sense. Yeah, <laughs> I've only realized the the degree to which like my background or like where I grew up is kind of a weird place. Um, as I got older, like I took it for granted as a kid. Obviously, like the two places I really knew were like, um, like where I grew up, which is sort of like the woods. Like, I, like we just would say like, oh, I live out in the woods. Um, and like the suburbs, like in the sense of like around like the suburbs around New York City, like up by like White Plains, et cetera, the Hudson, that sort of corridor. And then also sort of like Rhode Island suburbs, um, which is like where my extended family were. And um, the, like I always felt like uh, they were uh, like they always had like nicer things in the sense of like faster internet and um like the newer consoles and stuff like that whereas like where i grew up like we had dial up for like a really long time because it was like it was like out in the woods you know like uh so i always felt like like behind and i always felt a sort of like need to uh be on the to like uh be on like the cutting edge of things like a lot of the times like i'd get introduced to something from my extended family like out in the suburbs and i'd be the first person in my little area to like know about this thing or whatever like pokemon for instance or like dragon ball z or whatever like before that became popular and normative like i was like oh i or like you know emo music i, I was like really into like the long island the emo scene of music 
like really early on because that's like what my cousins were into but like no one else really knew about it ar- around where i was because it's not like it was on the radio it wasn't like in you couldn't there weren't any like stores to go buy music or whatever the only way you would know about any of this stuff is through the internet but also even having the internet was like a thing that a lot of people didn't have like i knew kids who's like they lived like so far out in the woods they had so many acres that it was like they had to run their own lines in. So when they finally did get internet, it was like satellite internet. And it was like the slowest fucking bullshit you've ever used in your entire life. Um, but it was like, but they also had like ATVs and, you know, like we'd go snowboarding in their backyard. They have like built a little skate park, uh, sleep, we'd sleep in a barn and shit like that. So it's like, I, that was like, uh, that was like what I, I grew up like, I guess, um, was more on that side of things. Uh, I, I, uh, I liked uh, hanging out with my white trash friends. I still do. Like those are, like, I'm still good friends with most of those guys, even though like my, my life path has kind of taken me inexorably out of that world. Like I could never like really return to it because I don't belong in it really. Like I don't like, if I was working as like an electrician or something, I would be in that world like still, but I, you know, went out to college and things like that. So it's like, I'm never going <laughs> to fit back in there. Yeah, it's, uh, man, I have a weird life. I don't even know. I, I could get into it, but I kind of need to process how I would even tell the public about it in a sense, you know, like, and I feel like it's probably not that weird. Know, like, what, even as I'm saying this, it's, it's not that weird maybe because there's like a lot of people with similar things. Like, uh, for like, the, like, this is like the background of a lot of the good, like, stand up comedians or whatever. Like, I, I, like, I, kind of um I, i'm drawn more to like like shane gillis as like a stand-up comedian because he's literally like just a guy that i would have known like and been friends with like growing up um basically the same sort of background being from like uh like rural rural ish uh pennsylvania in the sort of post-industrial area like that it's uh the same culture that i grew up with really um where it's like the uh you have like a lot of republicans but they're like the working class republicans they're not the finance republicans you know oh yeah yeah you know i mean okay so i grew up in the hood right my parents are activists for were activists for normal you know legalized marijuana and uh and they did uh and they did uh yeah not exactly and um they (laughs) it was a like blue diaper democrat you Same know, deep yeah. d- Democrat diaper. Yeah, in a way, kind of. But, uh, you know, so they were they were activists and they did like, you know, community organizing, like, oh, trying to keep this like library from closing, you know, helping troubled kids, whatever else they could do, um, you know, and, and trying to get the city to kick out the fucking slumlords uh, from this neighborhood and, you know, just that kind of thing but it you know it was a bit of like a, a a neighborhood watch type family so we became known as like the middle class snitches on the block in this kind of like poor ghetto neighborhood uh what where city? we were living in city just curious. and uh it was milwaukee okay. milwaukee wisconsin yeah so this was on yeah this was this was uh man uh, yeah, I'm not going to give the exact yeah, locations or anything, but like, left. yeah, you know, it's just out in, out in the, out in the Milwaukee, which is one of the most segregated cities in America. Um, right. And, and my parents really tried to give it all to make things better. Um, right. And even to this day, they actually shame me because my activism consists of like, you know, advocacy essentially, like just, or yeah, education, you know, just like, gonna, you know, it's not, millions. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I yeah, you you have to like go and and help like I don't know like troubled children or something. If if I have to go do that instead of being like anti imperialist or something, um, I mean they might have they do have a point. Like you know, it's really important for me to get uh, be a part of my community or whatever. But like, it's not it, just because I'm not doesn't mean I'm not legitimate person. Um, but but you know that's what they did. That's what they did. And uh, well, it turns out that ended up being a toll on their kids because uh, you know growing up in that neighborhood, we had to be sheltered. So it's kind of like either I'm in like the hood, everything's dangerous, I'm worried about getting robbed. I hear gunshots. All you, you, that's the crazy thing about the hood. People don't even realize like you, during the daytime and uh, especially during like around holidays even. But like d- you just hear gunshots. Yeah. Shots, like lived, every hour every four hours um, yeah. yeah and yeah it's just crazy 
and uh and uh neighbors just arguing you know no peace and uh you know just just not knowing if we were gonna get robbed or 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 at worse you know all the time but then like what happened is um you know we after a while i think it was like maybe eight or nine years old uh they, they got fed up with it you know we we had a drug deal murder in front of the house you know yeah. and uh I couldn't, I couldn't i couldn't we couldn't stay there and so we ended up moving to like this middle class neighborhood that's like the complete opposite of that and uh meanwhile the whole time i'm going to this like like gifted school because i was this kid that just like knew math for some reason like i just was gifted with like math skills and uh, you know not much else to be honest but like yeah. uh, well language language skills too i could read and write really really well as a kid for some reason um but um and i was obsessed with computers so they shoved me into this gifted school um and uh, that was like elementary and middle school in this like tiny gifted school with like one or two people my age by the time i was like almost done with it so it was really weird sheltered existence um really um i didn't learn how to be socially normal in any way um basically until probably i'm still i, I would say i'm still learning that um, i don't really know what's what, like it held me is. back a ton. there's different there's yeah. different well, planes of it for different classes is what the real reality of it is like when people talk about that because mm -hmm. like really it's like you're just acquiring like a sort of a class consciousness um and that's what it means to like be normal is to sort of fit into the uh, class consciousness of wherever you end up so like you'd probably be profoundly normal in a uh suite of other kids who are doing uh, in that sort of um that plane of uh you know the gifted kids or whatever but you probably but well, like i don't know it's like a, a you, there's people who are like um socially normal in um their elite like for instance i know people who like went to like business school you know they're eye bankers etc and uh they all are very proficient and socially normal within their class but whenever like they have to mix with like people from more of like the background of kids that i grew up with which happens uh sometimes you know with like i, I like weddings and things like this i've seen this happen um they don't realize how absurd and like socially abhorrent they are in uh, those mixed circumstances. Uh, I was actually having this conversation not too long ago because I was going to like a mixed family event and um, there were like these sorts of, uh, you know, business school grads, like upper crust people um, alongside just like more like normal working class people. And um, the working class people were like making fun of them in a subtle way, but they couldn't even pick up on it. You know, they couldn't even like get like they'd be like, they'd be like oh, yeah, like that's a that's a like uh, what what do you think? How, how has business school really um like helped you? It like change like how you view the world or whatever. <laughs> and like the working class dudes are like, you know, making like pull, like making fun of like how self-important these people are in their own imaginings, like just how they come off and talk. And it's like a bit, but they can't they don't they don't see it like they don't see the gap the same way so like they, they were like oh look i get along just fine with these working gentlemen or whatever they have no idea that they were like being made fun of that's yeah you know i would i would say that is that you know there's definitely like a specific set of dynamics for like certain you know things like that uh um but like what i guess what i mean is just like i didn't understand other people you know and like i'm somebody who's a little bit different i kind of have to like logically and intuitively you know develop this understanding it takes a lot of work it's very awkward you know and i think most people do have that but like for me it's it was harder because i was just born with like a numbers math brain not like a making other people happy type of brain you know and and i'm not saying i can't understand other people or be socially normal i can it's just that like that combination of circumstances held me back so badly um so i just ended up being like super isolated and painfully awkward for like pretty much the majority of my life as an adult and as even as like a teenager in high school like just awful 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 I, and i don't feel that way anymore i feel really awesome. good about myself but like you know um but no i was like this kid who would like you know i was like such a cringy kid like i i gotta admit like i was like playing like sonic on my thinkpad in in class in yeah. high school and like yeah you know like i was like <laughs> yeah i know it's really it, yeah it, it it's 
I, oh, I yeah, did things right. that I don't even good. want to remember. Yeah. It was fucking cringy, dude. It was so bad. Um, but uh, no, I'm not like that anymore. Um, I, I, at least I hope, you know, like, I don't know. Yeah. But um, I think that I was like, I was pretty well socialized, I guess. I never really like I wasn't um, like I'm cringe for my own reasons. Like, you know, I look back and be like, oh, that's cringe in the same way like anyone would. But I always had like got along. I always had like a lot of friends. I got along with them. Um, a lot of different people i could i'm generally i'm pretty extroverted as a person and um i'm pretty good at uh just uh like i don't know i have a good i i'm i like uh i'm good at like adapting to what uh the social circle is i think it's because i had to navigate a lot of different types of social circles um when i was younger um like uh i didn't have like any specific one so at the same time like i can fit in like into some way at these different social circles but i don't really belong to any of them um distinctly which is uh my struggle like it, i always like feel like it would be nice to just be a part of um one specific type of social circle or whatever but i'm more like shuttling between different ones so i don't, I don't really fit anywhere i'm kind of like a go between yeah, I, I can definitely relate to that. And, you know, this whole, like, thing you're talking about with these dynamics is kind of funny to me because, you know, um, I, and I, I don't want to offend any, like, LaRouche-type people that could perchance listen to this you or can, whatever you because... Them. I, do, you know, I them all the time. But, so but, it's a safe space. Okay, uh, all right. Here's <laughs> the Here's the thing. So I remember I was taking their classes a little bit because I was really curious about like LaRouche's economic systems and everything, right? Yeah. They're, and they're, I they're realized to that the people like you, like their whole thing is to to get you. Yes, yeah, right, exactly. And but but that's the funny thing. Okay, so first thing, um, I remember like I was at a CPI conference with Daniel, and Daniel Burke was there, right? And Daniel does this like squaring, doubling the square yes, thing, yes, right? Yes. And uh, yeah, and I like that. I don't mind that at all. Um, but the funny thing to me about it is like, he showed me the problem and I looked at it for like 10 seconds. And then I was like, well, I was literally just doing a bunch of like, uh, not like super hard, but like a bunch of like trigonometry and geometry math yeah, yeah. for like a video game I was programming. So I like looked at it for 10 seconds and I immediately solved it. And he got so like... <laughs> He's like, wait, how did you do that? And, and, you know, and I was like, well, because, you know, the, the, uh, the length of the line in the center is going to be equal to double, uh, you know, whatever. Yeah, I don't remember yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, but he's like, well, you don't actually understand it because you don't have the peasant boys interpretation of it, which is intuitive, yeah, which yeah, is about yeah, double yeah, triangles. Uh, yeah. And I'm just kind of like, no, nah, no, nah, I solved it. Like, what yeah, are you talking yeah. about? No, I like, <laughs> but, uh, I like and that's, guys. yeah. I like those guys, but like, you know, I'm like, I'm yeah. like, this is like my thing where I'm just like, they're like, you know, oh, I'm like, I was like, I like Playboy Cardi. And they're like, well, that music is garbage. And I was like, nah, it's pretty, it's pretty tight. It's pretty tight. I like it. You know, like, I, like, I just, I don't know. I can't um, get that. Uh, yeah, no, I can't. I can't do that. In the office. I can't do that either. It's, it's the hood in me, right? Yeah, like yeah. in a way, it like, sounds like it sounds so weird. Though. Like, like to me, like that. Yeah. Like, if, you get, if you aren't in touch with like that level, like uh, I was thinking a lot of uh, William Blake has the cardinalities of like the imagination, where it's like the North uh, represents like reason and like the sort of like can get cold, like the like kind of type of like cold autism, and the South is like you know like a warm like you know, but it's like fiery like temper you know and like emotionality like feelings and things like this, hmm. and uh, I think that's like the more human element you know where like e even in like in america you see this split where it's like oh the north is like you know the why like you know reason rationality science or whatever in the south they're all backwards or whatever but it's like you know what at the end of the day like you you are you need like the su the southern part the human part of it like like you know even in its excesses is um is more of like you like that's what life is really about is is uh hmm. is like this like this the, like it would be considered irrationalities right or like romantic sort of things where it's like you know um like uh like poetry is far more on that level although like poetry at its at its best can also be much like a geometric proof and things like this and like art also does have this level of like rationality and science and you know this sort of stuff but uh hmm. I, I can't I'm 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 more suspect in a lot of ways of the excesses of like cold re of pure reason you know like i'm i'm a i'm a post-enlightenment guy i'm a i'm a i like come on and 
you know, I'm not a Kantian. Um, I like the, I'm, I'm about the, uh, the, the, the soil, you know, the, the real, uh, basics of shit. So like, no matter what, like, that's like a, a thing that a lot of political discourse like loses because it gets so abstract into the realm of like pure logic or whatever. And then you have, um, it, it loses the, uh, the rootedness of the sort of well and and, yeah and not to mention it's all hidden axioms you know it's not like there's no all logic is based on hidden axioms i would rather have the axioms out in the open like you know like if if i think that i exist i'm just gonna assume i exist i don't you know what i mean yeah and then like people that people that philosophers that say you cannot prove that you exist therefore whatever 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 are basing that on hidden axioms that are just kind of weird well, and don't make sense actually, to humans. There's a really good thing, Kajevra, which is a dialogue between Descartes and the Buddha. Um, because uh, he was like saying that, like basically showing that like um, a lot of this like enlightenment rationalism was actually like when it comes to just like pure logic or whatever is um, actually very, uh, very uh, limited compared to what a lot of the Eastern philosophies had already done. Because it's like in Buddhism, in, uh, in these like Eastern philosophies, you don't just, I think, therefore I am. That's absurd because like they, you, you don't exist. Like the I, like this, the ego, this is, this is all an illusion. Like a thinking is occurring, but it's like, you know, like it, they, they have more of an emphasis on the categories of non-being and things like that, which are, uh, take, which are basically expelled from like Western rationalism, the uh, importance of the existence of, not, of the non-being, of, non of, of um, things that are not. Um, yeah, you, you know, you read like, um, uh, you know, a lot of people have read the Tao Te Ching, uh, which I've read, um, and I can't, I don't claim to understand it, but one thing that, uh, really opened my eyes when I read it was the kind of paradoxes in that book are things that, um, like, I can't, I can't think of a particular one, but it might be something like, you know, the, the perfect carver shaves off nothing, but builds a great statue or something like that, yeah, you know, and block, it, yes. Yeah. Or, you know, or, or as a different example, like the perfect fisherman, uh, casts no net, but catches every fish, um, you know, or something that it's this sort of, uh, they, they have this like sort of poetic, um, yeah and paradoxical uh striving towards this sort of contradictory non-being um and it's something that you know i i realize it's it's like it's actually there's some weird truth to it, it is, because um, i was i was uh, yeah my, my wife is very much more on the like logical side of things like she's like a c computer engineer like software sort of stuff and, like into um like she studied like uh uh, like logic and things like this at like a very uh, granular level, like, per, like, you know, what was it but like the girdles theorems and, and stuff like this. Um, uh, the very like bedrock of this sort of stuff, but at the very bedrock of that, you find someone like Wittgenstein also who, um, is uh tries to use like this sort of logic to create these paradoxes in the same way that Gödel's theorem is like this paradox created at the foundations of mathematics, which kind of unravel the whole thing. Um, that uh th th that uh that's what you end up getting at the no matter what like you end up getting to a sort of analogical uh way of thinking and uh the analogical way of thinking is not one that can actually be logically it's like the tau right the real tau is not the one that you can speak of it's the same thing with like these sort of what you're trying to express with paradoxes or analogical truths i might call them um you cannot just give them in like a statement the statement is like the finger pointing to the thing you're supposed to get to wittgenstein uses the metaphor of like the ladder where it's like his uh, his writings are like these exercises they're like a ladder that you climb in order to uh attain this sort of insight that cannot be put into the same words like in the same way of like socratic dialogues it's not to proffer a uh a, like Socrates and come out, it's like, this is how things work. What he does is he, he brings you through um, a series of like uh, steps to realize that you don't know the thing, right? And like that's yeah, the state the, of the, the paradox. Yeah, the, there's, an, there's an image that I really like. Uh, it was made by a, a former friend of mine and uh, she, she took this image, it was a house, right? And there's a tree that's growing through the roof of the house, just sticking up and out of it. And it was overlaid with that quote, the Tao that can be spoken is not the true Tao or something. And it just, it's the perfect like image for me, you know? Um, 
And um, and I also do think that it's a bit like um, it's almost like taking the logic uh, towards a more extreme extent. Like one one such paradox that I think of, and I like to say this to people is: by the time China fully privatizes their economy, they will be in full communism. Yeah, yeah, no, right. These sorts of things, right? Where they sound so like to the logical, like like we, you know, Haas and various others call like the, this Anglo box way of thinking where it's like things are in the categories that they're in and they're in these categories and the lines are there. Um, like they, they, it, they, it's repellent to them. It makes them angry to us uh, to, to pro- proffer what's effectively like a riddle, like a statement like that seems so absurd, but it's actually like true. It's actually like, this is the paradoxical reality that we actually inhabit. It's not, um, it doesn't follow these, uh, these categories of pure reason, et cetera, like it follows along these paradoxical, like almost ironical lines of development. Which itself, I think, can be a, a much superior form of reason or at least human expression of it. Um, Absolutely. You know, it's I, like I, Mao the, on contradiction. Yeah. Um, this, this is a, this is the, like, I, it, this used to be more part of the American, um, uh, American way of thinking as opposed to what was considered like British empiricism and things was like even the transcendentalists, you know, like Emerson would be like, well, of course, like, you know, um, a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds. Um, I've, I've th- thought of that quote uh, my entire life. <laughs> I love that. Uh, because I do think that's true. Like there, there's, there is no, um, there you have like the, everything's paradoxical because everything's becoming something that it isn't like everything's mo- in a process of development and like, you know, sublation and things like this. And I just think that this is like, um, uh, this was a uh, this this is taken for granted, I think, in normative conversation and things like that. Almost everyone um, sort of understands this intuitively, but to put it into words um, is already to put it into try to endeavor to put it into um, you know some type of like fixed form. Um, it's it, the Bible is full of all of this sort of stuff. Like if you think of the commandments, even like being in, like carved into stone, and then these things, the commandments becoming like idols, you know, and they start to what the, the what the meaning of them starts to like become the opposite of their meaning because of how of the way in which they're being fetishized and things like this. Um, yeah, I just see that happening yeah. all the time. Like you, and no matter what you do, like you, 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 there there's always something that cannot be expressed. Um, well, and, and I see it as um, there's a parallel between this sort of egotism of like these like logical midwits and the identity function itself. Basically, you know, the output is the input and it's an infinite loop. That's the identity function, right? The self-referential uh, point kind of um, things in themselves, you know, and uh, this is this is the sort of this is their idol, you know, and their idol is in a sense, a reflection of their own ego because your own being is the thing. It's the one thing that you are and it is self-asserting, you know? So I I see that as actually a type of egotism as well. Egotism is basically the prevailing ideology um, of our time, which is why it's like a, like you get all these people who are in the Marx and things like that, or say they are, and they're like anarchists of various degrees. But the thing everyone really has in common is um being in the shadow of like max sterner like even the nietzsche even nietzsche if you're into nietzsche or whatever or any of these other people um it's all in the shadow of like the the post hegelians and so you got like max sterner who's like i think like the final hegelian in um that real sense um because his whole thing was like okay um now all of this is like just discourse right like we can learn how to talk about all these various things but um then there's reality and so like there's all these things that are like becoming other things etc the only thing i can really um take to be mine is my ego like guys that like you know like i am not there's society and we can talk about society but there's also me and like to me society is just this other thing so like that um that's like the the bedrock of how we uh, is like this sort of identitarianism, like all of this obsession with identity. Yes. Like that is like, well, I'm ultimately like irreducible. Like, so then like, you know, people talk about like, Oh, Marxism, et cetera. It's anti-humanist because it's like uh, eliminate It's like saying that like the identity, like, you know, it's saying that like I'm socially constructed, but it's like, no, I'm not socially constructed. I'm me, you know, and society is this other thing. So like, I'm the determinant thing in my life is like, I make choices, per- personal responsibility, blah, 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 blah. We have this like obsession with the individual philosophically. 
Well, and, and there's this this slogan of like the the LGBT movement, which is only you know who you truly are. That's you know it's that's it's, a, it's, it's a ph- philosophical absurd. nightmare. Yeah, it's a complete nightmare yeah. to say that. That's that's pure solipsism. It's like it's such a fucking nightmare to think that because it's like you don't know who you are at all. Like actually, like you do, but you don't know it any more than other people do. Like other people know other things about. Like it it, it, it implies that like you've become a perfected being just by existing, and that there's no process of development in your own subjectivity. <laughs> you know, it's a it's a nightmare. Right. Like, right. It, yeah, no, it's like you've got, you know, a million social, su- uh, you know, social mirrors, essentially, to look into, and they're all distorted, you know, and even your own subjectivity itself is a distorting field, um, you know, so I would rather be like, well, how about this? Nobody knows what they truly are, and that's okay, you know, you, you just don't know. Yeah, there's no like final point of knowing. Well, I, I don't know. I think that there is a point of understanding, but um, it's uh, how, how do I? Well, maybe it? if knowing is a participation like, of some part kind, part of then yes. Where you're like, but... I'm not anything. Like there's like, <laughs> I'm, like this is like Sterner also that goes to like the creative nothing, right? But it's like um. Uh, I think of like when William William Blake like there's the difference between um the type of like mysticism which is like pretty bad which is like where it's like I'm God but you're not like this is like how most of these uh cult I've been watching a lot of cult documentaries because uh, they they come out that's like the true crime thing that I enjoy watching are about cults and like cult dynamics because they're everywhere now everyone on the internet is basically in some form of cult uh, or like running a cult of some sort. Um, but like the real the cult is like you know where uh in a negative sense is like to someone who's like i'm god and like you're not like you know so it's like you have to uh like you you know uh to you you have to, you're in this process of ascension forever you're in this process of suspended ascension i'm the ascended one so like i'm the criterion by which you could, are judged right um there's a difference between that and uh like that type of uh evil really and uh i would just call it purely satanic like this egoism um where it's like i'm an ego and you're not like you know i'm an ascended ego and you're not um and the one of like william blake where it's like i'm god and so are you like you know like we're like there's not really any difference like we're all in this process there's not really a uh there's no way i can be like you know your guru or whatever uh i think that's the uh more the more uh, healthy form of um this type of uh, spiritual knowledge or whatever, where it's like you you recognize the sort of absolute equality of all things in this sort of sense, where it's like everything is a uh, is a part yeah, of yeah. That man is made in the image of God. Yeah, you yeah. know, and uh, yeah, yeah. So it's like you know, um, you you like the, the There's a lot of paradoxes. I like this is like why I'm drawn, especially to Christianity, is because I think it's the most paradoxical of all of even the Abrahamic religions, whereas um. Because it's all like it's it's constantly like there's always further levels of paradox to unfold. Like you know, the more like because it's not like oh, um, the more you understand, that means the more license you have to do evil. It's like no, actually, the more you understand, the more the less license you have to do evil. You know what I mean? Where it's like uh, like uh, the the greatest saint um would consider themselves just as bad as the worst sinner, whereas the worst sinner would consider themselves equal in all ways to the saint. So like there's this um there's this fundamental like asymmetry where it's like uh you have more responsibility the more you understand whereas like in a cultish sort of thing the more you understand the less responsibility you have to others because it's like well I'm God so like I actually there's excuses I can make for myself like I can be cruel because I'm God so my cruelty is actually just you're not ascended like me I'm ascended I've reached ascension so like I can do whatever um I'm a justified sinner your sins are not justified you know things like that. Yeah. And, you know, I, I know what it's like to be that kind of a cult subject because, you know, I was in the IWW anarcho cult type thing yeah. for a while. I was in the PSL cult type thing for a while. And it relieves this sort of tension that it's it's a life giving thing. You know, it's it is something that is is crucial, but it also is is painful. Um, and it and it feels like you know, as beings, we're kind of lost in a way. And and the God person is giving us answers. And it, you know, in, in in a way, it can direct you. You know, it can 
by relieving that sort of tension, I think that it, it allows a person to direct their energy more productively, actually, yeah. and be more effective as a person in a sense. Uh, but then it, uh, it's also providing the same constraints for that activity uh, at the same time, you know, and um, it's, it, I just, the thing that you're getting me thinking about is like, what does it feel like to be that cult? leader person you know what does that person get out of it because i mean i know that they can get like selfish things out of it um you know like have like a sex cult or whatever but like what is it you know that's just a it's a weird thing to think about and it's kind of like you know should leaders try to be this way should they try to build cults is that the only alternative to liberalism or is it possible to actually have cult, a, so you know i don't, I don't really which it, it, it is it is it is you're right you're um, right so you know it's just it's it's that's that's a that's a difficult question for me you know that's a difficult one it's a what i well i think that there's different ways of like i think that all of them ultimately deep down know that they're like frauds like that this is like, um, so I don't think it's like a comfortable or an enviable position to be in, even if like, you know, you're making a ton of money, et cetera, et cetera, or whatever, like a lot of those people do. Um, deep down, they know, they have to know something's like, like, like there's a, the, you ever heard of like duper's delight where it's like, you can sort of see in them where they're like, oh, I've like, it's like a con man, you know, like a con, how does a, someone go mm. about conning people all the time out of their money? Well, they go like, this is, it's a very easy trick to make where it's like, no, you don't understand. Like these people, like they don't know it, but deep down they want to be tricked. Like they want to be fooled by me. So I'm like, I'm just relieving them of like their money. And like, if it wasn't me, it'd be someone else. Like I'm, I like, so, so like, uh, and if, uh, if it's bad for them, it's like, well then, you know, that's just justice. It's just fair. If, uh, if I, if I con you out of your money, then you've learned that you shouldn't be that stupid again. So I'm actually providing you a service. Like there's a lot of justifications that you can run through for this. Um, personally like i don't know like uh I, I i could definitely run more of a cult or whatever out of whatever i do on the internet but i uh, <laughs> i uh the logo cult it's coming no, no i really don't want to is the thing because like i have no desire whatsoever to, to yeah like, of course, to, like, of course. Have to manage that sort of shit it's a lot of work too like you have to you end up being a slave then also to your own image um that's like the worst part like, that's the part where it's like, mm. you know, like, I almost want to erase all of the shit I've done because it's like, I like, you know, now I have to deal with uh, the consequences of uh, not only uh, people who like what I do, but, you know, a ton of people who don't. And um, that's that's like also people in cults, like a lot of their efforts are going into like making sure no one thinks that what they're running is a cult. Right. Where it's like, <laughs> like uh, I watched uh, one of these documentaries the other day and the guy uh, what finally like destroyed the cult in a lot of ways was a. Uh, he made uh, some of his like higher lieutenants watch these cult documentaries and then write essays about why what they were in wasn't a cult. And I was like, that was just too much, you know. Where I was like, wait a minute, like, Fuck, well, I can't actually write this essay. I don't know how to distinguish between these two things because they're the same. Um, yeah, a good friend of mine actually got kicked out of uh, PSL for accusing them of uh, being a cult. It, it, it's funny. Uh, this is a big part of why we were kicked out of PSL is because um, we we discovered uh, that you know at, at first it seemed they were they were neutral on the issue of nuclear power, right? Uh, but then we discovered, wait a minute, no, no, no. In in 2019, this California activist named Tina Landis. Um, who's this, you know, crazy eco activist, she actually convinced the leadership of the party to add anti nuclear to their uh, platform. Mm. So they only support creating solar and wind, and maybe hydro or, or whatever yeah, yeah. energy to to replace the current system which is complete insanity and so me and my friend you know we kind of went hard on our branch leadership like hey guys like this can't be here we have to raise this to national and uh they kind of had an egg on their face after it um some of the worst copes i've ever seen like oh well uh cuba has really low energy consumption why don't we live like cuba well, because they're fucking poor. That's yeah. why we don't know. People don't want to be living like Cuba. Cubans don't want to be living like Cubans. Like, what do you? So anyway, so we we, we humiliated our, our branch leadership and the ideological line of our party. Um, and it 
it just um, they didn't like that. So they actually there was a restructuring. It was actually a party wide restructuring called the unit structure, uh, which split the branches into smaller units that were more localized. Of course, me and my friend got split into different units after mm. this whole nuclear thing goes down. Big surprise. And my friend was telling them, hey, I think this is a cult tactic because it literally it is. is a cult tactic. <laughs> and yeah, they did not like that. They did not like that. So he got kicked out. And I was told um, I was told that I'm a, a transphobe and a misogynist and that um, I have mandatory reading. I need to read these liberation school or liberation news articles and then write an essay on them and then, uh, you know, reply with an essay on, on why, why I need to support trans rights and all this stuff. Um, and I, okay. They kind of nailed me because I was pretty neutral on the trans question. Uh, uh, like I wasn't like a pro trans guy and now I've got more questions than answers when it comes to that issue. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, anyway, I, it, I'm not going to get into that whole mess yeah, right now, but anyway, I didn't take it. I left. So yeah, yeah. I mean, God bless. Good, good on you for getting out of that shit. That's just how I see all of this stuff though. Like, I don't know. I've, I haven't been drawn into the closest I was drawn into like a cult of any sort was like when we were doing frog Twitter, but that wasn't really like in the early days, it was before like it really developed into what it became where there was like a specific um, higher, like a specific like, higher like you know i was getting reprimanded for going against the party line or whatever and i was like i don't fucking care and eventually i got kicked out of that too um but that just seems to be how things develop um especially on the internet i think like the internet is like almost designed like the only sort of socialization that can really exist is through like what's called fandoms but you could really just call fandoms cults uh they're like cult, just cults so it's really hard to like do anything that doesn't ultimately produce a cult like i don't really I've, I've thought about this a lot like how do you do anything on this this medium without it just being like a cult like making a cult of some sort right right and you know like for me i learned to not act like a cult member by being in pretty much two different leftist cults leaving them and and having very hard reckoning with myself you know for a while i was blaming uh psl for everything that was wrong in my life afterwards i'm like wow these guys you know but then i was like well no actually this is a problem i have to solve i have to think for myself be my own person in a sense uh, but like, I don't think most people have had that hard reckoning. I think they would rather just be on. Um, and unfortunately, you know, it's true. I think they would rather just have an ideology. Well, they would like, rather be crazy. part of the fandom. It's nice, well, like the thing, like, I understand like the appeal of that. Cause it's like something I don't really have. Like, I don't really have a, uh, I don't have a, a little community or whatever. And like, I, everyone always uses that term. Like community is like, you know, Oh, I like being a part of a community. Like we're building a community. I'm just building a community. You know, I'm just my community. I'm just like a community builder. Like, you know, just a part of this community and that community. And I'm an advocate and ally of all these communities. And I'm just in the community or whatever. But, uh, I feel like there's like, there's a, that like none of those things are actually communities. Because what a community really means is that you have to actually, it's like not uh, exactly voluntary. Like um, like the community I'm in, like in a physical sense, is an actual community because it's not like everyone's like, oh, like you, you don't have like, oh, we're, like you're not in, you don't, you don't get to be here because you don't agree. It's like you're already there. So like you have to, a real community has to overcome like actual meaningful differences. And uh, uh, like, but uh, through something other than just like, kicking people out you know what i mean like uh uh so what it really is is like building these sort of um i don't even know i would, I would change it from like community i think is very different from uh what, what would be called like you know these are basically tribes uh and uh, like uh sects or uh yeah I mean, I guess, okay, so this is a thing, right? Because we're being hyperbolic with the word cult to an extent. Because I don't think what, so. you know, a real, well, I guess what I mean is like there's a cult dynamic that comes into fandoms, and that is cult. But at the same time, like cults are cults, fandoms have a cult dynamic. They're not, they're not the same thing as Scientology or something. Well, you know what I mean? That way. The thing is, though, is that they're in the process of becoming, right? Where it's like Scientology didn't start out as what it is. Same, like, it started out as L. Ron Hubbard fan club. 
Like, that's how it started. Like, he was just a science fiction writer. And um, this is how a lot of it ultimately, like, comes about, where uh, it's like, we're going to have this, we're building a community, you know, for the first place. So it's like the community of, like, fucking L. Ron Hubbard appreciators or whatever. And then it's like, eventually the people in charge of this thing realize that, uh, especially in the American structure of the economy, it's like, wait a minute, this would be a lot better to manage if it was designated as a religious activity because then we can avoid a lot of like taxation and things like that. So like as this community attaches, has more of like these business acute things, then you really want to incorporate all of it um, under like an NGO of sorts so that you, and then you have to justify that ideologically. And uh, that's really how you eventually end up with like a cult cult is who who's that one uh streamer that actually made a cult um, there's been a couple what's that guy there's been yeah a few. it's crazy yeah i think um, oh, fuck, that was the world of warcraft guy or whatever there's been a few though yeah Definitely. yeah no like it, it it does tend to go in that direction that's and, just the next um, logical step yeah. from a business perspective honestly like it's like you know like let's say you have like your your right you like taylor swift will start a church like if taylor swift started a church it would be a great business move it would be an incredible business move on her part she'll probably start an ngo of some sort i would imagine as things go on but um that's that's the uh it's the it's for better or for worse when we talk about like religious freedom in america it means the freedom to start a cult like we don't ask whether or not this is good in and of itself we kind of just are like it's good for because it's you know you're free to do that you're like free to exploit others in this sort of way like that's you know that's sort of the tacit understanding of things like we don't because then it's like you, you we don't we don't want to posit some type of authority that could d- t- distinguish like let's say like legitimate community organization from some type of cult right and obviously this has also been used in a political Political matter. Oh no! Someone in my reply said, "Would attend mass if Logo gives the sermons." See, that's like exactly the problem. Like, I don't. <laughs> like, I don't. Like, I really could do that. You know, it'd probably be a great business move for me to be like, I'm starting a church. But I really, that's the last thing that I want to do is to be a, create any sort of community and manage it in this way because it's it's sick it sickens me to be honest like the the very idea of it because i'm just a guy you know and like that's the truth of like all of these people like everyone's just the there's no there's no like there's not really any reason to to uh to idolize any anyone um for any reason there's no there's nothing to it at the end of the day there's there's just people what you should idolize if anything i wouldn't even say idolize but more like appreciate are like the products, the ends of whatever someone has achieved, like not the means by which they did so. Um, that's like, I never wanted to be known as a person. I just wanted people to appreciate my work. Like, so that's why I wrote under a pseudonym and things like that though, for a, as long as I could. Like, I mean, I still do, but it doesn't really matter. Um, I didn't want, like, I don't want people to, I didn't even want people to know who I was. Uh, I think that that because it sucks. It's it really sucks, and then you're 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 you have to exploit yourself. Um, but then you can even be like a, a QAnon, you know, like you you know what I mean. Like there's even a cults based around anonymous figures. Well, that's a part of the appeal in the first place. Is like um, one of my favorite lines from a little ugly man, great rapper, is uh, elusiveness is lucrative, which is true. Um, that that type maintaining that sort of uh, uh, mystery is a uh, is uh, itself part of the appeal of things, you know, like BAP, for instance, like I've known who he was for the whole time, uh, but he kept his identity uh, very close to the chest for a very long time. And that was like, that's part of the appeal. Um, Now, like eventually there's no way you can't keep that up forever. It doesn't work anymore. Um, Eventually it comes out. Even like when we talk about like people writing pseudonymously in the past, like that's always like one of the interests is like, well, who's actually writing this? And it's almost always figured out. Like it, it's very, very few people get away with it. You can't really, unless it doesn't really matter. If you do anything that matters and people are going to want to know who you are. Yeah, that's, I don't know. I don't know how to say it. Like, I guess there's a whole critical thinking thing about it too, I guess, you know, that, and that's really important. Like 
you can have a cult dynamic and recognize it and then do things to prevent it from progressing. You know, the natural way is for it to progress, just like how the natural way under our current system is for people to become more greedy and use everything to make money, commodify every ideology and identity into something, uh, you know, and, 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 and convert every single like possible political movement into a means of getting attention for money. Um, you know, it's like, that's a, that's a tendency that exists just like the cult tendency. Um, and, you know, so if it, but if you recognize that it's there, at least you can kind of do something about it or even take advantage of it, you know, because it, the ways in which, for example, a communist org becomes a cult, uh, um, you know, the ways in which it does can actually be a benefit to it. And when you recognize that since liberalism itself is a cult, if everything's a cult, then how, which, you know, what's right and wrong in a sense, you know, and, and that sounds really bad in a way it, it's kind of like, um, that it kind of reminds me of like adopting like a social Darwinist approach uh, uh, to things where it's like, well, power runs everything. So it's okay to use power. And then people end up abusing their power, you know? So I don't, I don't like that. I don't like that. That is a way of viewing things, but at, at the end of the day, we kind of have to reckon with it, you know? Yeah. I mean, you, you do, if you want to be involved in something like that, like a movement or something, but I don't know. I don't like you also as an individual, as a person, you don't have to be involved in any of it. Like, you know, I'm not involved in, I'm not on any discord servers or whatever. I'm not making these decisions or, you know, um, following some sort of line. I'm just me. Uh, I don't really, so I, I, I mean, if you want to do that, that's, I just feel like that's inevitable. I'm like, there's not really a choice to not, um, there, so you could say like there are some that is really just like, well, then there's like some cults that are more or less beneficial. There's ones that are more or less harmful, but there's not really an option to not um, be uh, to not make a cult if you're organizing people. It's like well, a basic and, organization of people um, in this way. Yeah, I, I just don't. OK. And then the other thing, the word cult is kind of like the word weed in a way, like in terms of a plant, you know, it's like so we have religions, which are the wanted cults and then the cults, which are the bad cults in a sense. And it's like, well, no, like there is there's a difference. And I don't think the difference is just a subjective matter of labeling. I think it has a lot more to do with the fact that religions tend to be based on some set of higher ideals for humanity more broadly you know um it's not um cults tend to be based more on a single ego or on like a group of people that are are benefiting from it kind of leeching off of it usually um so i do kind of think that like um uh, and and i know there's been historical de other definitions as well, well of like I what just, it, what it when called, you say like but, it's not inevitable i sort of like looking at like at least how i read the bible and things i sort of think that that's actually that it is sort of inevitable which is why ultimately like all of it like you know um the the antichrist exists like as a consequence of christ like because like it's that's that's like something that's hard to come to grips with but it's like the uh the or like the very process of making like you know these people organized around christ etc but then it's like what happens with that is inevitably it, it becomes something other than what it was like that through this process of development so then you have like these uh these splits and sect sectarianism and you know all of these sorts of these sorts of things um from the very beginning i don't really like, and like, and ultimately, like, the only people who can know, like, who are the true Christians or something is God. Like, you know, it's like ultimately something that only can be revealed at like uh, in eternity and at the, the end of things and the last judgment, et cetera, et cetera. So, and, uh, the, you know, there's even the line, right, where it's like, you know, many will say that I did all this in your name and I'll say I never knew you. Um, so I think that the, the, it's even like this is a sort of inevitability that um or at least the temptation for is inevitable is an inevitability um i don't i don't know it's like uh there's yeah it is important though and that's it you bring this up you know and i'm thinking like yeah because what it's doing is it's displacing the sort of ultimate knowledge onto you know onto god onto something that humans cannot know 
humans cannot be certain of, right? Um, and and so it's kind of and then the God's message is something that's kind of like filtered through these channels, and it, and the channels themselves are actually unreliable. So you have to kind of divine out, you know, everything from it in a sense. But like it's not, you know, it's not claiming we know where you're going to go, heaven or hell. We don't. We know, in a sense, because if you are, you know, if you're Christian, right, and, and you you believe in Jesus and follow His way and and all of this, then you'll be your soul will be saved and everything. But it, in the ultimate judgment, we don't human beings not claiming to have that final say, that final judgment. I think is is very very important thing. Yeah, yeah. I, it's just I don't know. I I've been thinking about this just because I've been watching the cult documentaries, and I'm just like. This is how everything on the internet works. Um, a lot of these cults like are now developed out of like Facebook groups and things like that. So um, I don't really, or like there, and I don't, I don't really know how to do. Like I don't know what the, I don't I, like at the same time. I don't really think that any sort of like voluntaristic organization of people is going is like that revolutionary in um, this day and age. Like I kind of think that like the revolutionary forces aren't necessarily um volunteering to be revolutionary well, forces volunteerism in general you know it's like humans are we're motivated by things that push us right people that are in a volunteer org are motivated by something and it's almost always something wrong with them or with their life because life itself usually in most cases is giving them some opportunity somewhere if they dig for it kind of you know it's not we're not at a point where people have literally nothing and i i think like yeah. if we are approaching that point that is what is going to motivate people exactly. in a revolutionary it's way would, it's like it's not that they would need to be convinced of something it's like that that would just be the material like what we're seeing is like there's a lot of anxiety right for something for like there's like um there's just a general anxiety and it's particularly america i would say probably the west in general that like something bad is going to happen you know, like bad things are going to happen, but they haven't yes. yet happened. So it's more like people, these sorts of things are more like defensive, where it's like people are trying to prepare for when the bad things happen, like that seem inevitable. I don't think anyone, like, even if you're like offering like a positive vision of things, it's like after the bad thing is that is going to happen is going to happen. I don't think there's any people who are in the short term, like optimistic about things uh, in the West. Um, there's a lot like if you're on the other side of things, like if you were in uh, China, for instance, right? Like they have a lot of optimism for like their collective project because things have been getting better. So they're like, we have reason to believe that things are getting better. But we don't have any reason to believe that things are getting better, which is why everyone like it's kind of popular to have a sort of revolutionary ideology of some sort. But it's not one that's being put into practice in any real sense. They're just like preemptive. Like it's sort of like um, they're like more like doomsday cults in the sense of being like we're going to or like we're getting ready for when everything hits the fan. That sorts that seems to be sort of the. uh the underlying like subconscious motivation of a lot of people uh organizing or whatever uh in, in this yeah way. yeah and, and i think there's a sort of actually right now um there's a good place for marxism that's being very underappreciated not understood is uh that people have a tendency americans have a tendency to not just become like libertarian but almost more like mutualist or like uh more like predonist there's like this this idea that people are are starting to have of like well you know why don't we just take everything into our own hands as people uh but not in the sense of of taking the whole state but just taking our community and becoming self autonomous you know autonomous yeah thing. well it's like you know there's a lot of there's like the big life a big lifestyle trend of being like living like oh i've got like my solar panels and my my little backyard farm etc and i'm trying to live like off the grid you know like this sort of um thinking this sort of homesteading uh ideology or whatever it's kind of baked even though at the end of the day 
you still need your medicine. You still need your surgery. Yeah. You still need to go to Walmart to get a toothbrush and all this. Like you're not actually self-sufficient. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, you know, yeah. but like, yeah, but so, but, and, and yeah, and I, I think it's important to like understand like the Marxism, the only reason Marxism matters is because it is a way of critiquing and refining all of this existing thought that people kind of tend to have in a situation like the one that we're in now in America. It's See, it's, like, it's a way of, I, yeah. I would say the only reason it matters is because it describes paradoxes that are self-evident already. Like, like um, I, I have a problem with like the orthodox Marxists and things like this where they tend to, I get into arguments with them all the time, uh, they tend to, like, not notice the actual paradoxes that have developed since the time of Marx or whatever, where it's like, you know, you could talk about, like, well, like, some of the paradoxes that are sort of self-evident to uh, people who would not consider themselves Marxists, like someone like Alex Jones or whatever, will say, like, well, all these big bankers and things are all socialists. And it's like, that's true. They are. They're just not socialists in the way that they're not like Marxists. They're like bourgeois socialists. Like they have essentially right. socialism for the like a type of neo feudalism. Like, and there's a lot of like there's a like critique of socialism um, in the American context, the Anglo context of like you know the road to serfdom and things like this. This idea of um of a type of social like socialism being like a wedge by which the elite can then like gain more power over um you know the expansion of the american state for instance is in our context not exactly an acceleration of socialism it's an acceleration of like exploitation on the behalf of the people who own the state which isn't the people you know like there's these sorts of paradoxes even uh there's that, yeah. that nick fuentes clip like even like nick fuentes is like fucking far-right catholic imperium or whatever the fuck he believes in like he's like well i'm not against imperialism per se like i'm not against a strong state per se i'm against like this imperialism you know like so even the people who are like openly like pro imperialism are still like this type of imperialism is somehow paradoxically opposed to like that my notion of him, like bringing back 19th century imperialism, you know, cause like things actually <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Where it's like, even like someone who's like, well, as a 19th century imperialist, I have a lot of criticisms of how we're running imperialism. That's what a lot of the NRX stuff was also where it's like mold bug, Yarvin, big appreciator of like Victorian British empire. Like that's his whole fucking thing is just like being like a Victorian cybernetics, like empire appreciator or whatever, being like the British empire was great. It built civilization and these places developed the productive forces and blah, blah, blah in these backwards areas and, you know, provided law and order in these places that were like had, uh, you know, uh, a lot of crime and anarchy or whatever this fuck, you know, that's, that's, so he's like, be, thinks of himself as like a humanitarian being like the problem with our empire is that it's not even good at being an empire because it's this sort of like destructive empire as opposed to an empire that builds like you know railroads and things like this or you know um and uh like so these sorts of ironies aren't really appreciated like you know you're looking at like you're talking about psl like not be, be, being a communist party or whatever that isn't in favor of like nuclear energy it's like so absurd um, so absurd, obviously absurd, you know, like, uh, it's like the most efficient form of energy. Like, it just makes no sense to, to be opposed to like developing the productive forces, but they're like, there's this paradox where it's like, we have all of these quote unquote socialists, but they're really anarchists and they're really, uh, just against the notion of civilization in its entirety. They're like primitivists. Like they want to actually produce the sort of nightmares that like a lot of the libertarian Austrian school people understood socialism to be like, there's this endless paradoxes of like people reflecting back and forth to each other, their own like shadows and then being like, yes, that's liter this, but on, on ironically to each other. So you have like the people who are like, I hate socialism. It's like when he makes everyone a surf and then there's someone who being like, yeah, I think that's good. Like, that's what I support. <laughs> yeah, the Yarvin. Oh, by the way, I encourage people to look in into Urbit. It's very strange and interesting it technology. It doesn't work. No one uses it's, it. It's a. It's well. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's 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 very new. Actually, is the thing. But 
Um, it, it's, no one uses uh, it, man. I, 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 no, yeah, no one uses it. Right. Yeah, no one uses it yet. But like, uh, they, anyway, they, they um, say, it's, dude, that's like the that's like the well, it's, bullshit ever. Everyone always says okay. That. Oh yeah, everyone's but like the, using it. It's like no, they're not. Well, no, I don't think everyone's going to be using it, but um, I think, like, in terms of, like, solving the problem of decentralized, uh, predictable computing, uh, um, it's it's actually very interesting uh, solution. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm not saying it's the one, that it's going to be the one, but, like, if you're, a, if you're someone that's trying to build, like, digital sovereignty, you understand, like, encryption, that kind of thing, like, yeah, you should really at matter. least understand what it is. It you should at least understand what it is. The only digital but, sovereignty that matters is on the level of like state power. Do you want to know as digital sovereignty? The Chinese, because they can torrent all this shit and they have Sci Hub, etc., and they don't care about Western IP laws. That's well, ultimately, sovereignty. ultimately, yeah. And there's a there's a funny dynamic of like the U.S. government is actually the main sponsor of this so-called digital sovereignty. Of course, they're Urban created, technology they're is created is cool. already being used by uh, BlackRock types, um, and um, the. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, for the oligarchy to yeah, open open passes. technology fund, uh, USAGM, which formerly known as Radio Free Asia, funds the Open Technology Fund, which funds Signal and uh, a, a bunch of other apps that are designed for you know so-called digital sovereignty. Um, and it sure there is the fact that it's it is end to end encrypted, um, well, but at like, the same time, what like, I mean, where it's like you have all yeah. these ironies, where it's like you go to yeah. the like Silicon Valley libertarians, and it's like they make Palantir, um, you know, like they're they're all about like freedom, blah blah blah, but what they actually create are like imperial technologies for like the further occultation of oligarchical power, because we have this d- perverted sense of liberty being like well, you know, shouldn't you be free to like own a bunch of properties that you don't live in and extract rent from them? Like they're your properties. Like you're going to try to take away my properties. And it's like, this is like how we can, when people talk about like liberty, et cetera, in this context, it's the liberty of rentiers. Like that is what they mean. They don't mean the liberty of normal working class people. That's the, the issue with the libertarian discourse in yeah general. and and to use a to use a yarvinism it's the sovereignty of the uh uh monarch ceos the elves, right the dark yeah elves, you see we are the dark elves yeah yeah but uh, yeah, no, it's funny how 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 Yarvin is like such a he's 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 good at connecting certain dots, but he pisses me off too. It's kind of I've funny. met him God. in real life. Like I think he's a qu- good guy. Like as an individual. Oh, I I think I don't so have too. Any, I don't have any like I think he's like a nice guy. Like you know, like legitimately, yeah. I think he's like a, a, on the level of like a person, like an individual. Like um, you know, uh, I like his poetry more than his theory. Uh, you know, but well, uh, and but, uh, and he's really damn smart. Really, really smart. Really creative he guy. Is, but he's kind of um, myopic. Like he's not as uh, yeah. curious uh, about um, some things that would like, th- this is like my, okay. People wanted me to talk about uh, the Alex Jones, Tucker Carlson thing. So um, I did listen to that last night. So I wanted to talk about that a little bit because uh, I wrote a little bit about this, like in the sense of um, like, basically Tucker's like, how did you know all of this stuff? And Alex Jones says, I just read the DARPA reports. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, that's really all you have to do. It's like all of this Shoot. stuff is just published. Like it's not, like Alex Jones doesn't have like he's not like looking into a crystal ball. He's reading just like openly published things by all of these like sorts of think tanks and things. That's just not like really of interest to most people. What he's become like popular for is the fact that he reads all of these things and then he's like, I'm gonna try to inhabit the mind, like or you know, by criticizing it of the deep state, right? So it's like, what is this consciousness that is this like this whatever that is producing all of this literature, right? And being like that, like I'm being like, oh, I'm having visions of like you know the DARPA controlled like blah 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 blah, and um so obviously that has a lot of predictive power because it's like these are the people who are like the imperial technocrats etc. Like like uh, Yarvin always talks about like the New York Times and like the cathedral, the cathedral or like these sort. The real cathedral are these like think tanks, like these think tanks that are writing like the Carnegie Endowment and, and these sorts of things. Like and they're writing stuff that very very limited amount of people are reading, but those are that's that's like the actual. But the people reading them actually like make decisions and things like this, and uh, that's true. Like you know you can look go down the branches, but the New York Times is like lower on that than say uh, the Rand Corporation because uh, the Rand the New York Times is contacting people like the Rand Corporation in order to like get uh, you know fact checked and whatever stuff like that. Um, 
So Alex Jones, he just reads all this stuff. He puts it together and he goes, this is what they're planning. This is what they're planning. Like, I just read the documents. You know, I've got my documents. Oh, the documents. Um, but he's not that curious about reading the same sort of thing from anywhere else, right? It's not like he's reading, like, the equivalent of, like, what the Chinese are publishing on that level. Like, he's not reading the, the Chinese Communist Party's internal documents or, you know, like, reading uh, – what they have to say, like someone like Wang Huning or like, you know, these other people, he doesn't, because to him, like those, those people are all ultimately just controlled by the American deep state. There is no dialectic for him that exists outside of the American context in like a global context. The only counterforce to these globalists is within America in his conception. There's nothing that happens anywhere else in the world that isn't ultimately controlled in his mind by the Rand Corporation. There's nowhere, like they have this sort of absolute unipolar sovereignty. That's the conception. So this leads to, um, in some way, this is sort of like a, an, I, like this is why even, um, it's like when atheists are atheists against a particular thing, right? And they're not even sort of like universal atheists, like because they don't know enough about other things in order to like criticize them in a real way. So, like, like, like you have someone who's like raised an evangelical in America or something. And they're like, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in any of that shit. But then they become like a new age, like Luciferian boomer, or whatever the fuck. And it's like, well, you're not applying this same type of criticism more universally. You're just like, and in a way you've just like inverted the, uh, the worldview and in a way, just a pure inversion of it, a pure, neg- just a single negation of it. All it does is buttress this worldview um in this in the way of like you're assuming that what they're saying is like correct in some way from from their side you're just flipping it on its head and like that's good enough so it's like oh the globalists and where are the anti-globalists it's like okay are there any other anti-globalists is there any other like anti-globalist force or whatever in in this way like anything that's like politically opposed is there some sort of dialectic at play in history uh in material reality where there's forces pushing back against this and it's like you could say like the BRICS countries or something and he would just be like well no the BRICS is actually controlled by the world economic forum they're just trying to take away the real american sovereignty which is with us um in this in our our, our the anti-globalist elites in america like the anti-globalists in the department of defense that's the real hope for the future are the anti-global is is himself and tucker carlson and these other people who are like slightly critical of their the this this project right they're like we're we're they're internally critical of it they're not critical of it externally they're not like the way that the chinese are critical of it you you see what i'm saying um that leads him to like saying ridiculous things like saying that china is an ethnic nationalist state like is just like ethnically homogenous which is absolutely not true china has extreme amount of diversity uh tons of different types of people tons of different languages in china it's not a han ethno state it's completely absurd he said that G- xi jinping admires hitler there's literally no citations on this nothing there's this is complete hogwash this is this is what happens though when you are only reading like you're only reading the atlantic council and shit like that even if you don't like the atlantic council you'd be like well they're, they're right about you know um, like, xi jinping is basically hitler like uh this isn't like really critical of it at the end of the day at the end of the day like tucker carlson might be critical of be, now being like oh uh, maybe the war in iraq was bad but uh, he wasn't at the time, right? So then it's like, well, how do you know you're being critical of the thing now, at the time now of the thing that's bad, right? Because it's like, then they go into like a whole thing being like talking about how Hamas is, you know, so terrible, blah, 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 blah. And, uh, you know, supporting the I- Israel and this conflict. And it's like, well, what's the difference? Like, this is just like this, like you're just a, an internal critic who's still loyal to the regime. You know what I mean? Like, it's ultimately worthless. Yeah, I, I didn't see that, so um, you know, I'm just listening. But um, yeah, I, I mean, th- this is just like typical. Like, you know, I like Alex. Jones. Like, I like all these people because they're at least like somewhat critical of these things. But I, you know, I also appreciate the people who are within, like, you know, writing at these think tanks or whatever. Um, I appreciate them for you know being like laying it out there on the table or whatever. Um, it's just that uh, ultimately, like, if you are just if you're, if you're, it comes down to the, the sense of like what your people are in the sense of like, if you're like, well, I only care about, um, my only concern 
is uh, the American homeowner or something like that, right? Like, you know, the, the American working class only, not like the, you know, that's it. That's all I care about. Then you're gonna um, ultimately, like, this is like the AFL CIO. You have like these domestic labor unions. Um, without this sort of global perspective, uh, not in the sense of a globalism, in the sense of like unipolar imperialism, but in the sense of like world historical perspective, then you're ultimately just doing some sort of propaganda for a, a hypothetical. It's like Nick Fuentes, right? Nick Fuentes will still support unipolar American hegemony. He's just like, my issue with it is that it's not Catholic. Like, that's it. They're like, you know, all the rest of this stuff, fine, fine, well and dandy. Like the fact that, uh, there are poor people and like we have prison colonies, blah, blah, blah. That's all fine. No issue with any of that. The problem is, is that it needs to be more Catholic. That's sort of like the Alex Jones, Tucker Carlson criticism of the American empire at this point where it's like, hmm. Yeah. Do, do you think they represent like a, a real faction within the establishment? You know what I mean? Like, I, yeah, I, of course. Yeah. I, I can't help but wonder. And then if, if that is such a faction, which I believe it is, um, then is it viable? And, you know, is it possible? And I think about this a lot. It's like, is it possible that somehow, some way, there's actually going to be some type of factional dispute within the U.S. establishment that leads to some type of peaceful transfer to a less imperialist, probably still no. imperialist, but like less imperialist power no. that's actually more of like a Kissinger type way of thinking, you know? Only by necessity, I would say. Like, for instance, you could say that sort of happened, like, basically, like, when the government is crippled. Well, even though we're, we're finding ways around that, obviously, like, you know, we have gridlock in Congress, all this sort of stuff, and they just find ways around it. Like, you know, um, like, uh, for instance, like, Biden was like, well, we're just going to make it the, uh, the our transfer, our payments to Israel, like, uh, outside of uh, congressional scrutiny or whatever. We're just going to do this, you know, like, in the backroom deals or whatever. Um, we're, like, we're not going to just pass this. Or, like, we're, you know, we'll, we'll find ways around having to uh, do things by the normative process. Uh, so, like, if you look at, like, you know, what was an example of that? Like, why, why was it, like, there was a retraction of American empire under the Trump presidency? There's nothing to do with whether the fact that, like, like if Trump was given, like, full control over the military or whatever, like, maybe he would have fucking gone to war with Iran. Like, who knows? You know? I, don't, I, don't, I wouldn't put it past him. It's not like he has any reason to be friendly with them or whatever. And he did uh, take out Soleimani because he thought it would be a good PR move or whatever. Um, but the real thing, like the real anti-imperial practice in America is just uh, the, is the, is the crippling of American, uh, the, the state. Like it's just this, uh, which is basically what, uh, like, you know, China and Russia, they don't have to do anything. Um, they don't have to like threaten to invade America or whatever. America's uh, own internal contradictions are what's tearing it apart. So I don't really see any transition to a uh, to like the end of yeah. the empire or something without that having coming about as like basically just a series of blunders, which is what we're seeing. Yeah, yeah. Like that's uh, like Ukraine is like you know how many billions of dollars we sent. It wasn't. It doesn't matter. Cause it, and like, you know, we had all the think tank, the NAFO think tank guys uh, losing their fucking minds being like, we could have beat Putin on this if we had all been unified and like, we had all like really believed in what we we're doing. But it's like the West is like, so has, is, is falling apart from its own internal contradictions to the degree that it can't even exert the sort of pressure that it did during, let's say the cold war. Cause during the cold war, people were like the, there wasn't as much of this tension within the ruling class itself. Yeah. And I do think like, you know, there's this idea that a lot of people seem to have and it, and uh, I, I suppose it is based on Marxism, but also history is like, yeah, the, the big collapse is coming, right? Like everything's going to unravel at once. And I can't help but wonder, it's like, you know, since 2008, um, things have not, crisis is not, crisis has not been the same. Um, where we, we've socialized away the giant capitalist crisis, uh, or at least tried to, or, or I say we, the government did this. I did yeah. not do this. Yeah, 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 and, exactly. you know, and I, yeah, I've been trying to break that habit, but you know, the, the thing is like, I think about this, like, 
are we are we going to have a big collapse or is it really just going to be this slow unraveling and well, um I, i'm Empire. also um i'm drawn a bit here to uh, larouche's uh, triple curve actually um where he talks about how like monetary and financial aggregates are going to grow exponentially while a uh, physical economic development decreases um and up to the point of a hyperinflationary blowout this is something he predicted in the 80s i think and um and uh, i think that's that is actually what we're seeing right now i think he predicted the bailouts um in 2008 and onwards and uh, it's it's potentially that we're not going to see like a conventional capitalist crisis, but rather that the means to avert the capitalist crisis and postpone it themselves become unbearable and um, themselves end up destroying our uh, currency. Well, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what's happening. Like the thing, is, but like there's still a lot of gas in that tank. Like it's not like they're not going to be like, oh, well, I guess we can't keep doing this. They're just going to keep doing it. And it's not going to work as well as it did. Um, to like put a bandage on the thing like if you have a gangrenous wound like with limb you know you can keep covering it up and like you know the rot spreads and you go uh you know shave off a little pieces but um it's the the rot is like this core of the thing so like really the only like uh, as hudson says you know it's not a problem it's a quandary there isn't a way out of it the only way out of it is for like an actual like revolution to occur and that's not feasible under these conditions right and like so like a lot of like most of the effort is going into forestalling that revolution right that's why we have things like january 6th etc and like we have an expansion of the um surveillance state and you know the, the, the operations uh sting operations like jan 6 and a large part of the black lives matter movement to get the yeah. radical right and left you know, in, in prison, basically, or yeah. discredited um, to postpone any sort of revolution or get them to fight each other, which I actually don't think they're going to do. I think they're going to they're going to unite because when I saw a Boogaloo boy going to a Black Lives Matter protest in uh, 2020 and he was standing beside them, I was like, nope, these guys are not going to fight each other. Like, yeah, you think you think it's going to be a bunch of written houses. It's not. It's not yeah. because they're going to learn. They're going to realize. And um, it's it's something we all know. And you have to be literally psychotic and so heavily propagandized to think otherwise. I think like the horizon for is more like 25, 50 years, if not 75 years, depending on how well this decline is managed before there's like any sort of real um, organization to uh you know kind of overcome this uh this condition but uh things are gonna get worse before they get better i don't think there's any way around that like um think about like we're going into this election cycle it's gonna it, this is like re- late like fucking late r- roman empire type shit where it's like who like like you've got rfk you've got biden who like shouldn't even be running because he's like gonna die at any moment and is like extremely unpopular with his own base now even the people who voted blue no matter who are even starting to be find it distasteful you've got trump who would probably win if you could was able to just be on the ballot of it just purely out of like um spite like people are people are mostly voting for trump as a way of punishing the the state <laughs> like they're not voting like I don't even think a lot of people, at least subconsciously, they sort of know that Trump isn't like going to fix everything, but he's like a way of like fucking like you get a lot of amusement from making um, all these people that you hate have to deal with him. You know, yeah, I mean, I will or, say there are the people definitely they exist, uh, you know, maybe libertarians or, or people that just want to, you know, want Trump to to say F you to the deep state and and all this stuff. Um, I also think there's. A definite uh, dynamic where Biden and Trump are trying to actually appeal to the same people, which is the vanishing middle class, right? They didn't really. The thing is, is that the reason partially why Biden won is because he really, on a policy level, wasn't really distinct from Donald Trump at all. He took a lot of Trump's rhetoric and his positions. He didn't really like undo or reverse anything major that Trump had done. Like, like that's that's like what sort of. If anything, he was sort of saying, like, I'll do more. That's why you see some of the people who are, like, on the, like, the sort of more, like, even in, like, uh, I guess you could say, like, you know, if you look at, like, MAGA, it was really more like the upper levels of MAGA who are closer to, like, the white nationalist sort of thing. And if you're a real, like, white nationalist type guy, Joe Biden's your guy. So is why you saw, like, a whole, like, a whole set. There's a lot of people who are, like, on the alt-right or whatever who are now, like, Biden guys. Um, 
because Biden well, is yeah, is planned planned parenthood is a yeah, planned parenthood and LGBT movement is a much more effective form of white supremacy than any of this like groiper yeah. shit. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Exactly. Um so uh yeah, the 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 basically like the real distinction is like uh the people who liked Trump because they uh are trying to punish the establishment. Like those are the like the people like what Michael Moore said about the people in like the Midwest who are like saying like they're going to vote for Trump because fuck you to the Democrats is really more what it is. It isn't even like a positive thing. It's more of like fuck the Democrats. So it's it, it does kind of remind me of your comment about Jones, where it's like selective atheism, right? The Republicans are the Democrat anti-Democrat atheists. Yes, and yes. The, the, you and know, the Democrats vice being versa. Republican atheists like that's. Yeah. And yeah. And, and, and I'm not, a, I, you know, I might've been raised atheist, but, uh, you know, I'm, I, my father was a closet Christian and, um, you know, I'm someone that tends to have faith that there actually is a better way faith in humanity, you know? So I, 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 I can't subscribe to that. And I actually, I find it hard to imagine how people can function when they don't have that like positive content of what, you know, what could be, what ought to be. I don't know how people can, can be happy when they, when they have, have no you know sense of it well americans um, aren't it, very it, happy in general there is not they're not exactly yeah yeah and, and then this is something you know it's like um a lot of the older generation they they they're living off memory you know they're living off this this old um and 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 nostalgia and and you know i hate i i we have nostalgia, nostalgia has gone like, out of control the, i the mean power of nostalgia as like a salve in america is to such a degree that taylor swift's nostalgia for her own career of which is now and ongoing but a her eras tour which is remember how the the last 10 years of my career basically was such a powerful solve that she is the time person of the year and like <laughs> was like is basically like the pope like <laughs> Maybe That's more powerful than the body, in the American context. Like it's not a g- looking good. Yeah, that's 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 so fucked up. I didn't. Uh, dude, like, and 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 you know, I I think about this is something I was thinking about the other day. It's like people can live off of ideology. Like if their life is not like actively killing them, even if it is. If they're propagandized enough, if they truly believe, they can live off of ideology, you know. And, you can survive, um, sure. Yeah. Yeah, you can survive, and and you can even and you can even say that it's a good survival if you feel that you're doing it for a real reason, you know. Like the difference between like you know a monk who goes into isolation to attain enlightenment versus a man thrown into solitary confinement could be living the exact same life, but one of them will come out of it, uh, like you know, uh. <laughs> enlightened and and extremely like either optimistic or inspiring or something the other one will will actually want to die you know and and never be happy again so you know no like sometimes like you know like uh like there are people who are like like the the copium the the copium people can live on uh copium copium is a big part of uh the american diet (laughs) yeah Uh, it's the copium meme it's literally that like that's so accurate epidemic um yeah, because it's like it's uh, because uh, you wanna you wanna you wanna belong to something, you know. You wanna have this. It's a uh, it's a uh, kind of alienating. I think it's kind of freeing, but it's also alienating to not really to just be like, yeah, all of this is a uh, bullshit. Uh, the ruthless criticism of all the things being like, you know, being like, uh, yeah, that's not going to change anything. That's not going to make anything like things are just going to get worse. Like, and you just got to accept that, um, that no one really wants to hear that. It's, uh, you know, everyone wants to hear, uh, on every level of American society, no one wants to hear like, well, you know, the kind of end of the American empire is sort of inevitable. There's not really, you can do stuff to forestall it, but it's, it's not going to, it's, it's, it's the, the best days are behind it. Um, no one wants to hear that. That's the path of the like liberal mind now. Basically, it's like, well, um, I've lost all faith in humanity. Uh, global warming is going to destroy the world. All of this stuff, um, and I need, I'm going to take pills now. You know, that's basically the pills are the thing that's keeping them alive at, at this point. 
you know, and, and that's actually part of, that's part of why pilsers are prescribed is because they base it on reducing the chance of self-harm or suicide. It's about averting the human crisis, essentially. It's not about thriving. And, and so you, you have these extremely mentally ill people who are just, you, you know, antidepressants, keeping them alive. Everything's, you know, about to end. Um, I don't know how conservatives cope with it. I'm guessing they also take well, they antidepressants. See, they see but, the, uh, they like the conservative copium is like it's kind of it's kind of more based in a way right where it's like the QAnon copium where it's like the revolution is happening very soon the this cloud the storm clouds are over us we're gonna march on congress like actually uh it's underway like like the 1776 is commencing right now like trust me like the revolution is gonna happen tomorrow like trump's gonna clean it all up like you'll see like their copium is like there it's more um they're they're definitely less uh like resigned you know they're that's why it's like you know why maga communism has something to it in the sense that these people actually do like that for them yeah, the or even the news. yeah even the rapture itself like you know i used to work a job um and um where i would listen to to people's phone calls uh to write captions for them it was an assistive technology and the content of the phone calls was a uh, confidential but one of the themes of the calls that was very common and it surprised me was just how many people think the rapture is coming anytime soon especially uh covid uh during that time oh yeah i mean it was it was crazy yeah i mean uh that's that's a big part of uh specifically like american religion um in going going way back uh the these uh sort of like this is that like you know this is the end times like it's happening like you know the, the what are the, i think it was the hutterites um there's a big big wave of uh where like they you know they they go and do their numerology in the book of revelations and they're like this is the date of the ascension you know and we're all gonna go to this place and then we're gonna ascend um so like they they have this uh they have a faith in like some type of um moment where things will inevitably uh like some type of crisis which will appear as like something horrible to everyone but they're in on the secret that it's actually good yeah, that that reminds me of this. Uh, uh, I can't forget. I can't remember which tribe. There was a Native American tribe that they had this story the when they were being. Uh, it was. It was when they, I don't know. I don't think it's that. It's when they were being colonized, and I think I read this in um, uh, the book Black Elk Speaks. So you can probably figure it out that way. But it was they had this myth that their people were going to go into a magic portal, and they were going to go to a dimension where they're not being colonized, and that's where they were disappearing to. Yeah, this so is the ghost. The ghost yeah. dance for the Lakotas. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it. That's what it was. I think. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe the Lago- Lakotas had the same thing. I'm remembering now it was Ogala's that uh, had this particular myth. But um, yeah, I, I guess it. It was a popular a kind thing, of thing that got know. spread. Um, like th- there's a there's a lot of ways in which like the Native American religions um, or like you know their developments um, were also like mirrored. Like this is like a lot of where like Mormonism comes from too. Uh, <laughs> like the Mormons are the Mormons have that belief too. Like you know that there's going to be there's um what's it called? Let me look it up. There's the Mormon prophecy about the con- like about the Constitution being imperiled, and they would be the ones to restore it or something. And they're like the White Horse prophecy. That's right. That's right. The White Horse prophecy. Um. Yeah. That, uh, yeah, yeah. They're, they'll come in on a white horse and, uh, you know, save America. You will see the Constitution of the United States almost destroyed. It'll hang like a thread as fine as a silk fiber. Um, it'll be preserved and saved by the efforts of the white horse and by the red horse. Um, Smith, yeah, this is, a uh, believe Joseph, yeah, this is when Joseph Smith was running for president. <laughs> But it's part of it. Like they, it's something that they uh, they hold on to. Uh, Glenn Beck and things have have uh, have yeah, have uh, brought this up before. This is uh this is like what the Tucker Carlson Alex Jones wing um see like that uh they'll there's gonna be some sort of uh their hope is for some sort of crisis upon which they can like uh re centralize 
their their ideological vision of things and like you know bring about make america great again you know yeah and it it also kind of reminds me of the the separatism you know because i i imagine a lot of these people believe the south will will separate um and you know there's also the the uh, california and texas separatist uh threats that have yeah. been you know kind of so i i also kind i can't help but imagine the possibility for a fracturing. Now, I, I don't want there to be a fracturing at all because I think that it would be the one of the fractured entities would be the counter revolutionary one and it could end up being more powerful if kind of like Europe all comes behind them and you know it, it who knows who knows what kind of outcome that that would be. Um, but yeah, you know, yeah, that's another thing for sure. Um, and um, yeah, I I mean, I don't really know. I just, I, I think that it's kind of kind of impossible be, just because of like how large the like let's say that it, like how would that work with the department of defense you know what i'm saying because it's like <laughs> like let's say they that, would have like, to be know, incapacitated succeeded. there's no way there, there would have to be a military coup or some type of crazy thing that makes the military not actually work because there's no way that the current military wouldn't like suppress anything like that they're already good enough that they can suppress the ideology of it like um it's actually funny how like um a, a lot of people aren't aware of of like cal exit for example simply because it was suppressed so well on social media um and considered a censorship target by the fbi but, yeah um, yeah i mean that's the thing is that we have such a we've developed like our our premier use of the the sort of imperial technology here is to like suppress that uh this sort of um any sort of like mobilization in on a of like a on like a popular front or whatever like that so i'm i'm not really bullish on uh the the revolution happening um maybe not even in my lifetime um i really think that like things are like it took a long time for the roman empire to to fall apart and it didn't happen um like people are still debating to this day like when was it that it fell apart actually it's just kind of um it just becomes more and more corrupt and that's all that we're seeing happen is that the state is just becoming more and more corrupt and kind of opaque and kind of more it's kind of less and less open to like actually having any sort of challenge like like what sort of real like you know what what real challenges are there on the field here yeah like, and even and, if you look at like yeah. you want to compare the platforms or whatever of Trump Biden RFK um, and Vivek Ramaswamy, uh, Ron DeSantis, Nina, whatever, all of these various people are thrown out there, even like Cornell West or whatever, even though he has no shot in hell. And I think his campaign's already defunct. What's the real, what's like, what, what real, like, they're not really that distinct. It doesn't mm. really matter which one would get in. I don't really like, it would matter in the sense of like the mass psychology, but that's pretty much it. It wouldn't change anything. Yeah, and and I just I really think that it's it's like an out that's outside of the boundaries of the system in a sense. Like that's that's undefined behavior, you know. Um, in a in a sense, you know, it's like what the system. Like if you you know cast a magic wizard spell to put Cornell West into the presidency with no other side effects, they would probably find a reason to expel him instantly. You know, there wouldn't be like a you know, like so so then you kind of have to beg the question, like what under what circumstances would this even occur i also don't think that he would actually challenge that much i think it would just be like having obama and i don't really see the the different like what he would do like i think that you know he'd be taken into a room with like the cia or whatever and they'd be like listen you know here's the like hamas is doing bad things you got to come out and like be opposed to it. you know what i mean like that's yeah I, I, what, like it's like look at like a, someone like aoc or whatever right where it's like you know she's, she's you, you, people talk a big talk or whatever and then it's like when you're actually getting pressed by these people who have like kind of more permanent positions kind of unelected positions um in like what we'd call the deep state or whatever but it's really just like the massive uh production of these like kind of post-constitutional agencies and things like that those people like have a lot more yeah. sway and like that. was it uh was it Carlin or Bill Hicks? It was who did the bit on how like they yeah when you get elected president like they take you into a room, to a room and, they and they show you the JFK the JFK yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah it's kind show of more the, like that yeah yeah yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I'm sure it is. And yeah, and so he would have a choice, you know, either I can defy the state and it'll just die or I can leave or I can do what they want. All uh, right. And um, and uh, it's uh, 
how would I say it? Like, yeah, that's, that, but that's, again, that's like the magic genie spell type of thing, you know? And, yeah. um, I, I do kind of wonder, like, um, the locality of politics is an interesting thing, too. Like, there's weird anomalies that happen on a local level, and they don't seem to bubble up to the top. Um, but, like, you know, like, it's weird that there's a Trotskyist who was elected to the Seattle City Council, Kashama Sawan. Like, people don't know that there's actually, like, yeah, some random Trotskyist actually got elected in Seattle. And, you know, like, is there going to be more of that? Like, you know, um, yeah, the, there'll be the, more like yeah. wacky local but, politics things that ultimately amount to nothing. Like, but, but in the, of that. Yeah, and, and it is suppressed heavily. Like, you know, the Green Party was actually uh, kicked off of the ballot in uh, Wisconsin, my state, because uh, they actually gave them the paperwork with not enough time to fill it out and return it. Um, like in theory, they could have done it, but it would not have been. It, it was a superhuman task that the the government gave the Green Party to to do this, and so they returned it late, of course, and they were already printing ballots by the time the Green Party got back to them. So they screwed them over. They screwed them off the ballot. Um, you know, LaRouche organization in New York City. Um, I, if I remember right, they had to get 15,000 signatures to get on the ballot. They did. They got on the ballot. And so they raised it to something like 45,000, um, you know, yeah, a year they, later. They, they you know? changed, so. like, it, there's just so much like it's it's like a it's a full time. It's a full lifetime job to like even be like well this is how like things actually like it's not like our system is like openly oh everyone understands how it works it's like no actually like it's a complete fucking mystery to everyone and you have to be like an expert in like the particular like legalities and like the differences and all these different jurisdictions it's this extremely byzantine thing that's designed to become more and more complicated and more and more opaque um because like 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 think about the fact like if like Americans, like it used to be a bedrock of like public education, you'd have civics, et cetera, right? And it was like very important for you to understand like how the government works, like how, or at least in theory, like how it's structured, like the different branches of government and blah, 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 blah. But this has been completely wiped out because it's much easier to subjugate a population um, through this type of like just in the, the the deployment of like imperial mystery where it's just like people, Americans are just like, how does, how, how does insurance, how does any of this work? Like everyone's just like, how does any of this work? Like how do, yeah, like, it's, how a, it's a British tactic. Work? It's a like, uh, you know, uh, Paul Cockshot, he's a, he's an Anglo box thinker, but he has a great video on the colonial mode of production and how the British basically just could use money to obfuscate what it is that they were doing to the colonies. And, you know, it's like, uh, it's like they, they threw the colonies into like Chuck E. Cheese's with these tokens and let them play games almost, you know, it's like this, this, this sort of artificial monetary reality that's just has a little bit too much, uh, cybernetic variety for the average person to understand it um and as long it's as that's the case, it's a, it's a I, perfect I, control mechanism any any it control, like yeah. camouflage where it's like the more absurd like this type of absurdity of it the type of like incomprehensible like because none of it's like well how should it work it's like well no 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 that's not the question like the question isn't like what would make sense or like what would be intuitive or like no it's like how does it actually work well that's a completely different question you know and like people are always like, why are things the way that like, why is it like that? That just doesn't make any sense. It's like, yeah, it's not, it's, it doesn't make sense for you. Like it's not supposed to make sense. Like making sense to you would be a public service, but it doesn't exist as a public service because it's not your government. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. And then yeah. there's this funny, like libertarian ideal where it's kind of like, oh, well, this is just an IQ test. Like if you understand this crazy variety, then you can get on top of it and you can exploit other people with it. And then the yeah. high IQ people will benefit. But in reality, the IQ is IQ superiority is not even real any kind of real superiority at all. A high IQ should not be venerated, except for maybe in the fields in which it actually matters. Well, the, the other irony about IQ is that it's like a, it's actually an invert, like the the like for instance, like at a certain level of like upper middle intelligence or whatever, it does actually improve your prospects for like uh, an outcome in life or whatever. It correlates to like success or whatever, like climbing these hierarchies or whatever. Like you, like if you have like a one twenty IQ or something like you can get into like the c-suite of a fucking insurance company or whatever like it like you you're capable of doing that in the way that someone with like let's say like an 80 iq isn't like just because like of the the demands of like understanding like you know even how to deploy certain like verbiages and like the old jargons of these institutions etc like you have to have a certain level 
of doing that. But um, at a certain level of IQ, it's actually inversely correlated with life outcomes. Like super high IQ people um, have like the type of varied life outcomes of like super low IQ people too, right? Because there's, there's super low IQ people who are extremely successful. Like you don't have to be that intelligent or whatever to to be uh, Cardi B. You know what I mean? Like you can make right or, or be like a be like Trump. a celebrity celebrity Kabbalah guru or some shit. You know, yeah, like yeah. yeah. But yeah, and then the super high IQ. I mean, you know, I've got a high IQ, and that's it's it's good for what I do. I've always had enthusiasm for like computer programming and such. But like, I've never felt superior because of it because nobody gives a shit. And, and if you start trying to show it off in any way, well, because your IQ exceeds the other person's, they have no way of knowing whether or not you're just bullshitting them. So it, you can't, yeah. you know, you, you can show off what you've made. You can show off what has an actual ends. But at, even even at that point, you know, how do they know that you didn't just steal it? How do they you, they don't they don't, you know? Yeah. The, I mean, there's there's yeah. extremely high IQ uh, guys who just play chess in the park and are homeless, you know, like. And yeah, like. Like there, I like I don't know. I encounter like they're like uh, I don't know. Like uh, it, it's not correlated with like uh, success. Like th- it's this idea that like it's, that's basically like the just world fallacy. It's like the just economy fallacy, where it's like, oh no, actually the market is like selects for like you know merit or whatever. And it's like, well, how does it define merit? And it's like, well, it defines merit by like being able to you know um, exploit <laughs> people for money. So it's like if you're really good at doing that, uh, then you could be more rewarded than someone like who it's not like it's selecting for virtue right and not to mention the whole race science component of it that's just kind of stupid and disgusting well, but, the thing um, with the race science and that's what that that's that's what about. i was talking about with Moldbug too like that's yeah. the thing about him that pisses me off like i don't like race science shit um and i that the that is, that's that, what that, like, me off, that, like but, those studies are out there so just being like oh i just like don't care and i don't believe like whatever like yeah i mean like that's fine on like a normative level but like in terms of discourse like you do have to sort of engage with it so like the thing that i'm always saying is like okay let's say uh that like this is like really mad like you know you like okay so you need to have something to for these people to do like let, we can't have everyone being a computer engineer or whatever right like it's just not realistic it's not feasible but there's tons of productive way there's tons of productive things that like anyone can really do at like any level of iq and it's like, okay, so if you really cared, like, even if you're, you're like, okay, so you're saying it's only, it, they're basically, it's not even like they're, they're like my co-ethnics or whatever. They're literally just like my co, uh, a plus students. Like that's really their, their, uh, they, they're not even like they, these people are like IQ nationalists or whatever, where they're like, um, uh, um, they don't give a shit about like the guy who can go work in a factory or something, right? Like working in a factory is a dignified job. You can, you know, produce real goods that matter. It doesn't for, like for, Dude, uh, for a lot of it doesn't require. All, yeah. All the high IQ people are going to, they're going to move to Bitcoin land. You know, that, <laughs> you know, that Bitcoin Island animation uh, thing. <laughs> you know yeah, what I'm ironically, about? like they, they <laughs> yeah. eat, like chicken tendies and stuff like a lot, like <laughs> being, being really high IQ also means that you, you have to be really smart to be really dumb in a lot of ways. Like, um, you can't, uh, Marshall McLuhan used to say, you can't propagandize a native in the sense of like, you need to have like a certain level of IQ or whatever in order to be socialized into some of like you could, if you were completely like retarded, you can't really become like a hardcore Scientologist. (laughs) And And I, high IQ means high ability to rationalize everything. Right. So, (laughs) so you're also more manipulatable in these sorts of like rational things. You can be manipulated to go against things that are like intuitionally seem wrong to you because if you know what I mean? Like, you, yeah. like, uh, like, like if you look at the, uh, the communities of these polyamorous people and like the cuckold fetishists or whatever, generally higher IQ than just normal, normal heterosexual people generally is trending more towards the intellectual side because like these things, like you, you have to be like sort of rationalized into these things are kind of abstract, uh, things. <laughs> Yeah, no, and that's the funny thing, like, you know, it's like I'll meet, like, these, like, trans women in the tech field a lot, and uh, it's like, yeah, they're really smart, I usually actually get along with them, and it's just kind of like, but why, you know, a lot of times I'm just kind of like, but why are you like this, you know, what, but what, you know, and, and the, it's, it's, I, and I know why they are, but, like, I wish I could ask, you know, without antagonizing in a sense, you know, 
But uh, um, it, and it, it's like I understand where they're coming from, but like you, you know, you, you don't realize what you don't re, you don't you have too high of an IQ to realize what it is you're doing or what it is you are a lot of the time, um, you know. And, yeah, I yeah. mean, it's like like intuitionally, it's it appears differently to people who aren't like, well, you know, I can rationalize all of this. Like this, like that, that's like the like why you see a lot of these tensions in like a, like stand up comedy and stuff like that. Like you see a lot of these like what's allowed to be joked about or, and whatnot. Because a lot of what stand up comedy is is just people who are like um, a lot of pe- it's a lot of people pretending to like be stupid um, in a way. Or like, you know, like being like, what's the deal with this? You know, like, like just trying to adopt the sort of uh, perspective of like just a normal guy, like just an intuitional guy. Like, I'm not that smart. I don't understand it, but this is how it looks to me. You know, that sort of stuff. So it's sort of like, how, how can a guy become a lady? Like, that doesn't make any sense to me. And it's like, well, are you stupid? Like, have you not read all of the post-critical gender theory? Like, blah, blah. And it's like, you can, like most people know they have no, they're, they're just shooting from the hip. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's, that's all that it is is like like people you have to you have to be pretty like it's the difference also between like let's say the um like cradle normative like catholic and this is how i compare it sometimes like who who like their conception of like being in part of the catholic church or whatever is like celebrating christmas and thinking that their dog is uh waiting for them in a cloud kingdom um you know with their with their great aunt and you know all this sort of stuff that's all that it really means like and uh you know so types like you know doing like magical rituals in order to find lost items praying to saint anthony to find their car keys like that's all it really means to them but then you have like some of the converts that are like well actually what it means is like you know aquinas was right about everything and like oh, it's about this it's about the categories it's about the the, tr- the you know it's about um this sort of philosophical thing or whatever yeah yeah and i can't help but wonder if those people have ever felt like religious ecstasy you know like there's this you know the, the, it's, it's, there's a very important feeling that you get when you're in church um and i i, I mean I, I consider myself an atheist right but like when i go to church i get a sense of like okay you know this is i i'm feeling something greater i'm feeling a greater power of some kind um you know talent slate where are you what are you laughing at me or what what's the deal do you want to speak or what's the deal or are you just laughing because of something funny i'm not aware of oh i don't know i I didn't see i haven't been noted i'm just uh, i'm like pacing and like so i'm not really looking at the screen yeah Um, no i've i've been pacing too that's funny (laughs) i'm a pacer i pace all the time whenever i'm talking yeah, no, I have my um, best conversations when I'm walking, so, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, like, that's, like, the other, like, the intuitional, like, understanding of it is, like, very different from the uh, rational understanding. Um, and ultimately, like, that's more of the, uh, the more powerful thing is, like, people grasping it sort of intuition. Oh, we'll let Talon on. What's up, Talon? The everyday Catholic who prays to find whatever, and then the freak uh, convert who's like gets all into the nitty gritty for them. Oh, okay. Gotcha, well, gotcha. Thing. No hard it's feelings. It's the same thing, like when it comes to like economic theory or whatever, because you got like people like who are like they haven't read Marx, they haven't read anything. They watch like two schizo YouTube documentaries, and they're like, "It's the bankers, it's the damn bankers, the globalists and the bankers," and it's like. Yeah, you know that's true. <laughs> like it is the bankers. Uh, yeah, the world, uh, the the world, the clearinghouse banks, and like over there. Uh, yeah, and, uh, yeah. Marxism is, yeah, is the most. Uh, it's the most obvious cliche ever. Marxism is. It's 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 the most straightforward, obvious cliche ever, and yet yeah. people deny it. No, but then you have like these hardcore, like the orthodox Marxists or whatever, and they're like, well, actually, uh, this is, uh, you know, the, like they go so in far into like theoretical abstraction that they end up like saying obviously retarded stuff and uh yeah 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 they 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 reify marx's worldview they don't understand dialectics at all um and you know it's like did you realize dialectical science demands that you have to throw out any part of what marx or lenin observed that's no longer true right like you actually have to weigh it they also like don't they also like don't like like 
like the sort of Stalinist Maoist lines. Cause it's like, like, you know, Mao, like the, like communism is a hammer we use to smash our enemy or whatever. That's sort of like saying like Catholicism is when I pray to St. Anthony to help me find my car keys. Like, it's not the, like, like, you know what I mean? Like that's, yeah, yeah. You're, you're getting to the actual application of the theory, right? It's not, we're, we're never going to, Marx was not going to lead a revolution. It wasn't going to happen. Yeah, no, he wasn't even, it was not even remotely plausible. Like, that's not what his uh, forte was. He was just a, you know, a dude amongst dudes writing um, good, interesting things, you know, that's, and by no means, not the only person in the entirety of world history to ever write anything interesting or insightful, which uh, brings me to someone wanted me to talk about uh, McLuhan and Marxism or like both um, those sorts of things. I would say that like, uh, like, uh, I was actually talking to McLuhan's grandson about this. Cause he was saying like, what do you mean? And I was, cause I, he was like, I don't think McLuhan was a Marxist. I was like, no, I don't think that he was a Marxist. I, I don't think that he probably even really read Marx. Um, he didn't really have any interest in that sort of thing. He was more of like into like Harold Innes and, uh, these other sorts of, um, these other sorts of writers. He wasn't really that interested in economics, like really at all. Um, but he was interested in, um, the changes in like the what you could like the technological superstructure and their sort of result in changes on like mass psychology and culture etc which is really like if you think of um media theory and like mediation like that is what McLuhan is working in is media theory and meet the theories of mediation and things like this um like the ultimate medium of exchange was capital like that is Ultimately, like what Marx was working on, too, is this sort of media theory. And there's obviously a lot of Marxist media theory and thinking in this regard. Um, I just think that's uh, like and McLuhan claimed he was doing a phenomenology of technology, yeah. of technological development, which I think is uh, that's why you see a lot of the um, the French like post-structuralists or whatever, these sorts of like French Marxists in that time period of the 20th century, uh, someone like Baudrillard. Uh, the first thing he ever wrote, like his thesis, I think, like his dissertation thesis or whatever they call it in France, was on Marshall McLuhan. Like that was the first – That's and like Baudrillard is sort of like the figure that you can see is like very similar to both of them. Um, I just think uh, like uh, it's sort of like a mutual blind spot that a lot of – that exists in a lot of um, – a lot of uh, Anglo discourse is this this notion that it's like um, like this the, that uh, this Marxist stuff is something that's irrelevant to us because we have our own things here, you know, like like we and like we have our own like that's just part of like a kind of foreign tradition that's like a Soviet thing that's like sort of like a Chinese thing or like back in the day that was like a German thing, um, mm. but. Uh, so like you'll get a lot of people who are like very interested in like philosophy and like you know media theory and culture and like religions and things like this but they don't really have any interest in like political economy or like you know economics or Yeah and like and, and these are the people where and this is something that I've been doing in in my activism um and I I love it which is is where I am a bit of a nerd I'm not like I am good at managing people towards objective ends, but I'm not like an ideological leader type. I'm just not. And I consider myself a bit of like a shadow celebrity in a sense. Like I'm just, I'm connected to a bunch of people, but nobody knows me. But like, the thing is like, I talk to people about, um, and these are like normal people that wouldn't be interested in Marx. Otherwise I talk to them about it and I actually have a skill of getting people to understand it, um, or helping them to, to understand it in a way that's actually effective and meaningful for them. Um, and, um, and I, I'm really proud of that. And it's something I've, I've worked on really hard to do. And every like Marxist nerd needs to devote themselves to actually being part of an apparatus in a sense of, of actually creating something out of this instead of thinking you are the soul, you are the, you are the one, no, you, you are, you are, are supporting, you know, you are part of something. And, and I think that's really important for us to understand. Yeah, I mean, like the that's like the real reason why people have a sort of disdain for Marx, etc. Is because like you know they they understand Marxists as being basically people who don't appreciate anything, um, you know, like just being like in the sense of like uh, like literature or something, being like oh like these Marxists don't even appreciate like they don't appreciate like they're just criticizing everything, like you know when people are like get this Marxism out of my video game when it's like a deconstructionist like critique of video game narratives or whatever, you know what I mean. Um, 
there's there's there just tends to be a sort of like philistinism to the anglo left where it's not like they're like uh oh and uh like we appreciate uh shakespeare or something you know what i mean it's like marx really yeah. appreciated shakespeare and uh you know dante well, and, uh, and these sorts of things and it's like and i think uh there's even like a thing like the just the name marx has something about it that's intimidating inherently maybe it's just the x but like yeah. there's something about it it makes such a good like boogeyman for people you know it fits the it fits their niche for what they want to blame um and uh and I, you know i guess a lot of it comes out of the red scare a lot of that is engineered but like it even even in Marx's time, you know, Spectre is haunting Europe. All this, you know, like yeah, there's, Marx was a there's, bit of an edge. Yeah, like he he was having yeah. fun with it. Like he's also more ironical uh, and like funny than I think is like um, popularized. Definitely. Like people are like treat him like like oh he's this big serious man or whatever. But he's kind of a goofball, you know. And like that's something that also like the uh, the conservatives will like try to say to like deflate him. Like he didn't even have a job. He was kind of like this weird guy just like writing in like squalor and like smoking. And like, he said all this edgy shit and it's like, yeah, that's true. Like, yeah, <laughs> that is true. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, it, you know, I mean, it's how, how else to be, you know, and, and if, and if I was in his situation, you know, even in my own situation, I don't know how a person is ought to be completely wholesome and not have some type of cynicism because I mean, you, you have these people fawning over like Biden's PR moves. You have these fucking clowns on TV, like uh, Jimmy Kimmel and, and people, then they're super popular. And it's just like, what, how do you not become a pessimistic person in this app? atmosphere you know like what <laughs> yeah well ironically like a lot of the people that they really like are like the same sorts of figures like a lot of um you know like stand-up comedian like someone like tim Dillon or whatever is like that like he's kind of like a troll like you know he's a troll like he's this sort of trollish figure of being like very ironical and like caught like very um acidic and acerbic in his uh, statements and things. And I think people do like a lot of what the conservatives in America are like, we, we tell it like it is, you know, like we're not afraid of offending people, things like that. And I was like, well, neither was Marx. Like Marx was not afraid of offending people at all. Like, yeah. Was, and, uh, it, and it's almost like a more extreme substitute for it. You know, it, it, it's like, um, how do you, you take the passion and you take the logic out of it and you get even more passion, but it has nowhere to go. That's what I'm seeing, you know? <laughs> Um, we, we, we need to, we need to be able to, to square the passion and the logic with each other. You know, we, I'm, I'm tired of the logic Lords and I'm tired of the, the people just screaming, you know, it's, 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 it's too much. We need to, we need to solve this problem. You know, we need to be, we need to, we need to actually get to a point where like, um, um, people who, people who, who actually understand Marxism, like, you know, people who actually understand it are mainstream or at least accessible, you know, people who can articulate well, it in a way is, that actually the problem, matters. You the know? problem is, is that it's like, well, like, you know, there's, it's like, I don't know, like, with the, uh, like you get like this popularization of it, like pro through things like bread tube, et cetera, but it's actually worse than if it was not like it, it's worse. Yeah. that There's all this, like it, it, people don't realize the degree like when they're useful idiots, the degree to which like they're they're being promoted uh, or being allowed to yeah, I, I guess, exist um, because so, they're destroying the possibility yeah, of this thing when, being actually gripped by the mass. Yeah, and when I say mainstream, I don't mean part of the the apparatus, you know, media apparatus of social media apparatus or whatever. What I mean is that it's an idea that just becomes part of the culture, you know. I and think it's that something, the thing is yeah. is that like pretty much everyone has already grasped. Um, even like devoted anti-Marxist or whatever, um, his like contributions to like hermeneutics, basically like being at, like interpreting world events, et cetera, is already so profound that there's not really any way of going back from it. Like even the greatest critics of Marx and Marxism and Marxist movements, et cetera, on every level have fully incorporated like all of his, the most of his critiques into their vision of things. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, there, there's, a uh, like, like that's, a uh, that's sort of the iron. Like when people talk about ideology, like they're using this word, right? Like people who are like, yeah, I'm not a fan of Marxist ideology. And it's like, they don't realize how kind of funny, saying that is in the sense of being like ideology is fundamentally like a Marxist term, 
you know, and like the Marx wasn't like, here is an ideology that I am making. It is an ideology. It was a criticism of ideology. So it's like, if you want to be critical of the ideology, you're already engaging sort of in Marx's shadow. Like, like That's, that's, that's really, funny. I, I, yeah. You, you've got, you've definitely got a few things to teach me on, on that, you know, um, well, it and, really uh, comes down yeah. to like, you know, it comes down to like the note, like ideology is really the same thing as idolatry. So it's like, you know, other people are like, oh, the Marxists are like idolaters or something. And it's like, uh, what do you mean by that? You know, like it's a like ruthless criticism of everything that exists. So how is that idolatry? And it's like you could say, I guess um, there is a degree in which they say something that's sort of true, which is that you have like uh, Western Marxists or whatever who have a sort of um, – made an idol out of the critical role, like in the sense of just being purely negative and like, you know, criticizing gender and criticizing this and criticizing that and criticizing everything in a kind of unproductive way. That definitely is a tendency that I think they try to address when they say that it's just sort of yeah. like, people give a lot more credit to thing. Like, I don't know, no one really reads anymore. Uh, this is like the main problem. So people like ascribe the, all of these like intellectual positions to people who it's like, no, these people like, like they don't, they're not like studied people who have like, re- like read anything really. Like it's, you yeah. know, like, I, I, I kind of, I kind of get annoyed when people are like AOC is a Marxist. It's like, there's no way she's read any of that <laughs> shit. Like what are you talking yeah, about? I, when I, when I meet people in real life, you know, I like one thing I like to show them is that, you know, I just have um, uh, all these books on my phone. You know, I used to have an e-reader. I used to have all these physical books. It's like, no, I just have a bunch of books on my phone. And when I, I have some downtime, I might. Yeah, sure. I might look at Instagram or whatever, but I am going to start reading one of these books right off of my phone right then and there and uh you know i i it's funny because it, you know people who who care about things like this they they'll they need to just see that you know they need to see that example um um I, i've actually had a few people like uh, either like try to make fun of me for reading like in public it's kind of funny um, oh, like dude, it's actually yeah, it's- yeah. We, we do have like, it's a very like, America is very like anti-intellectual on this level where like reading is uh, considered kind of um, like, uh, like why don't you just be normal? Or... Yeah, like pretentious. Like, who do you think you are? Like, why are you, why would you read? Like, who do you think you are? Right. <laughs> Yeah, and, and and there's this thing about you know video, right? Now, video can convey all this information, so you can learn things uh, from video at a faster rate than reading. It's proven. I don't uh, think that's the, true. Well, but at the same time, uh, that is only assuming that you're reading the book in order, you know, and that's that's only assuming that you um, that you're you're how do you say like uh, this is this is completely uh, like yeah yeah you can drink more water from a fire hose too. It doesn't mean it's better. You know I what I mean? Think, I just think that's like objectively not true. I guess it depends on like your reading level or whatever, but it's like you, if you like had a podcast, right, you could listen to it and it might take like two, three hours or whatever, or like however long it is. But if you had the transcript of that, you could get through it much faster. So like reading that's, is actually the most, yeah, that's most, reading is like for the most efficient thing. It's just that it requires more of the person doing it. The reason why people like videos and things like that is because you don't have to exert any effort um, on, in terms of like, um, and it's like, you know, trying to like basically trick you to concentrate on it. Like, you know, like people like these, uh, like, you know, uh, the, the grab it, like attention grabbing sorts of things. We have like an attention deficit. Um, and, uh, like reading is like really like it's kind of like working out or something if you want to fo- learn how to focus. Yeah, your absolutely. Yeah, no, reading is is like it's like eating broccoli, but for your attention span. I mean, it's 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 really good for you. Um, and and it's funny because I it gets me out of bad mind states too. You know, like like people people will get bothered you know and you can't stop thinking maybe it's just me uh because i've always been this way but you, sitting with a book it, it it's one of the most peaceful things ever but what's funny is that oftentimes i hate it at first i don't want to pay oh, attention yeah. to the book i don't want to but once i'd commit to it, it it's it's one of the best things really yeah, it's just hard to like, you know, um, like, like, uh, it, it, I, I don't know. It's like, it's like, if you don't enjoy it, like, don't do it. You know, I don't know. I don't, like, don't try to like tell people that it's like, oh, like you're terrible for not reading or whatever. But it's like, I do think it's like, uh, at least for me, like I, I, 
I think it's more uh, been more transformative of like my. I think it just more changes like how you're how you can uh, view how you think than um, any other medium can do that. Like you can uh, like if you can listen to a lot of music, but it's not going to like really fundamentally uh, change the way that you think or like l- interpret things. Cause I just think that like, even just like the process of like accumulating a vocabulary, like having more words in order to describe more things is a way of like transforming creatively your engagement with the world where it's like, if you have a very limited vocabulary, it's very difficult to like creatively describe something in its specificity. Like, right. Uh, right. Yeah. And not not to mention, you know, uh, we're both people where we will read something and then we can later refer to it, um, digest it, explain it, and draw other people to it. We can have a collective sense of of this. And and uh, you know, what's the incentive to read Marx if you don't know any Marxists in your life? If you don't, you know, have any need or or desire to articulate Marx to other people. Yeah. It's just you know. that, like, people are in a condition where it's, like, how is it, like, a lot of it is, like, people are looking for, like, the most popular books are, like, self-improvement books and things. People are looking for, like, how is this going to, like, help me out? So if you had the thing where it was, like, seven Marxist tips to maximize your revenue on, blah, 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 <laughs> like, that would do really well. Like, that's what people want. Well, you know? like, that draws me to something that Richard Wolff said, which uh, it was, uh, if I had to hire, like, an accounting team for my business, I would all I would hire all Marxist accountants because they understand things the best you know like there's some level like marxists need to i don't to, i, I kind of don't know. like richard wolf i'm not gonna lie <laughs> yeah like yeah uh, no i don't i hate i i hate his uh whole like co-op thing i think it's it's really stupid yeah, and um, yeah he, but, uh, like, uh, i could see hudson getting a little frustrated with him because they were talking about china on this uh recent thing i posted today uh, i was listening to that this morning um like they were talking about china and uh hudson's describing like why like you know they have like you know they're the a real estate problem or whatever like that uh these like private banks were extending too much credit etc but he was like but ultimately you know the the credit creation is like um done out of what's effectively like the treasury wing of the chinese state as opposed to having a private bank like the federal reserve doing it so they actually do have the power to like you know maintain uh people's the people themselves, like the people on the ground, like their ability to like own the things that they have. And the only people who are going to eat shit are like the bank executives of these private banks. So, uh, you know, and, the, and by the way, just interjecting, that's literally the position of the libertarian Mises caucus. Like there are libertarians who understand this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so he's like, he's like, and he's like, and that's because they're like socialists, like in the sense that they, that like the creation of credit value, et cetera, like in this, this form, um, is a public good. So it's socialized in, uh, it, unlike the way we have it where it's socialized, but it's socialized for private ends. So like we do have this type of like oligarchical socialism, which he calls like financial capitalism, but other people you could call it like, you know, financialized socialism or something like that. Um, or, or just fascism, if you really want to go that hard. Um, uh, but like Wolf's like, well, if they're like, he's doing the whole, like, well, China, like they should, they still have these contradictions between the fact that like not everything, not all of their businesses are co-ops. And it's just like, shut the fuck up. Like that is not the fundamental <laughs> issue. Like that doesn't really matter that much. Like dude, at what the kind end of, of the day, what kind of Marxist are you? Like you, you seem to understand Marxism to a good extent or, and at least be able to apply it to our current he economic doesn't, circumstances, though. but he doesn't, he does. That's the thing. Like he, it's like, what did you just read? Like David Harvey or something? Like what did, you you didn't read Marx. He he was critical of uh, um, was it LaSalle who was the guy that said we need like just state sponsored co ops only to be the yeah. whole economy. Yeah, that was literally a major critique of Marx. That's really important. Like you don't know that. Yeah, I mean he's he's like a he he's like the uh, he's like a YouTube Marxist kind of guy where like his whole thing is like he he's focuses like Hudson like tries to describe how Marx is actually a continuation of classical political economy which takes for granted these sorts of criticisms of like rent extraction etc and hudson's like you know most important contributions are like in regards to like the highest level of like financial shit like in like the clearing houses uh, bank of international settlements um you know credit uh, creation etc this sort of like highest level of the economy which is ultimately determinative of like the things below it in terms of like policy etc like you know like whereas like wolf is still like a kind of like just criticizing like like why isn't amazon a co-op 
And it's like, that's, that isn't really like, that's like the, such a dead end. I don't know. Like, yeah. I, I don't know how people don't see that. That's like a dead end at this point. Well, and uh, yeah. And in co-ops. Okay. And the thing about co-ops, right? So there's this interesting guy, Dimitri Kleiner, and he talks about a uh, venture communism. And, uh, I have a friend who's, who's really into that guy. Uh, uh but you know, he, he, um, Talks about you know how this th- there's going to be some type of co-op system that can can overturn or upset the existing economic order, and uh, I'm using like cyber technology and and all this stuff, and I'm just kind of thinking like, well, y- no, because at the end of the day, if the co-ops are competing with each other, then they're actually going to end up being basically just like a slightly different form of of capitalist market competition, uh, you know, like Yugoslavia fell apart for a reason, you know, like it's not. <laughs> Um, uh, like to, you, just Richard, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't understand like, you know, wages, right? If you want to, to be part of a competitive economy and your co-op doesn't have like this sort of like brand market rent where like the name of your co-op has some meaning to people like Coca-Cola or Apple that makes it more valuable. You know, if, if you're not, if you're not getting money from that or from monopoly rent from being like a literal tech monopoly or something, then your money is is profit from exploiting labor. All of your profit is from exploiting labor. Therefore, if you want to grow, you have to pay your workers very little. And so co-ops in practice, and this is true, actually underpay their workers quite a bit uh, um, in, in many cases, and usually take on more of a volunteer angle of like the people working here are doing it because it's morally good or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't, and they're not competitive. Like discount yeah. on goods because it's like a yeah. lifestyle thing. <laughs> Yeah, it's the the private accumulation um, of capital um, as done by, you know, fully private non-co-op institutions. That's way more efficient in our current system. It's way more competitive and co-ops are never going to beat that. Yeah, well, that it's sort of part of like the just general like degrowth sort of mindset where it's like, well, we should create more inefficiencies because it's more fair. Like it's just moralism, you know, like when like I think that's a. that's like a temperamental thing where it's like, uh, like this, uh, type of like, uh, like moralism, I think is far more on the, uh, like, you know, let's make sure things are being fair and like done through processes so that we can account for their fairness or whatever. I just think it's like a, it's like a fixation, uh, that is ultimately, I think reactionary, but it's very difficult to explain that to people who are like, we're the real progressives. Cause it's like, they identify basically with their, this sort of moralistic perspective, but like it, it, it's only, it's only convincing to other people who are like moralists and moralists don't tend to be involved in the actual productive roles of the economy. Um, you know, like yeah, up, up yours woke moralists, like, come on, but you know, and, and, and there's the human thing too, like, you know, people want a friendly, they want to work for a friendly company in a sense, you know, uh, and, and you have companies, you know, kind of like Trader Joe's, for example, that are all like, you know, oh, we're a friendly company, you know, whatever, uh, they, they do certain things like they'll, they'll, you know, hire people with special needs and they'll like pay their workers a little bit better and give them a little bit more benefits and try to, you know, make maintain a certain atmosphere and all this stuff, you know? And I feel like that's like wolf and maybe co-op people, maybe they feel like they're like friendlyifying the economy, you know, like we're just going to make everything like, yeah, everything's just a little bit better. You know, we're all just a little bit nicer, you know, and, and we're all just cooperating with each other, you know, it's like not, yeah. this, not a business mindset at all, but yeah. Uh, that was the thing that was bothering me with the uh, Richard Wolf, Michael Hudson dual interview. I just felt like, you know, like, I feel like Wolf kind of just like in his comportment was even like kind of being like, yeah, uh, Hudson knows more about this because uh, he does. Like, it's just, it's just like they're operating on different levels. Like Richard Wolf is like a professor guy. Um, you know, he can be like, I've studied and taught Marxist economics. It's like, sure, sure, sure. But uh, Michael Hudson worked for Chase Manhattan and like understand like actually like there's a certain level where it's like I take uh, someone more seriously if they like actually applied what they're talking about in a real way um where it's like you know okay could richard wolf get a job at a fucking bank like i doubt it well could yeah, michael hudson? yeah he well yeah <laughs> he would <laughs> you could hire michael hudson to like organize something like bricks or something like he's crazy smart you know it's not 
it's not a joke. Um, you know, it's, I honestly, like, I have a hard time reading him because it's so thick, you know, it's like, I need to like start somewhere. I could try to force myself to understand, but like, I appreciate Michael Hudson more like all the time, even when I don't think that I could, like, there's just like more things that like, I'll read more because he's written so much. And, um, like, uh, he's very revolutionary, I think in even, um, like, I don't think he's like an orthodox Marxist, which is also like mo- why he's particularly interesting um, is because like he, he's like, you know, he's done like a rehabilitation of a lot of the like American school of economics. But like also like, you know, not just merely being like, we need to go back to that in some sort of uncritical way. It's just like he, he he's just like a, and like, you know, his work on like Babylonian economics, like it's just like a massive feat of like intellectual like labor, really. Um, I, I can't really think of anyone, any other like living figure who I think is um, as as like wide in scope and like as deep you know like yeah uh, i you, you know and it, there's one thing you know uh the larouche people are critical of him partially because of a personal feud but uh, yes. they, they say that they have uh, a lot they're, of those so they're but their critique of you know but marxism right their critique the larouchean critique of marxism is not just a conspiracy about uh bolsheviks being funded by the british and that kind of thing uh um it's actually this idea that marxists have a problem of being like i think they use the word pathologists so marxists are good at at finding the problem and diagnosing it and explaining how you know why it exists and all of this but they can't actually give like a positive content to the solution um right and um and i think that's more of a critique of marx himself because i really think like yeah lenin and stalin are the ones that that gave it more of a positive content or even kim il sung you know and and larouche even if you know him being more of a crypto communist in a sense but like you know he's someone who gave it a positive content um and um it's it's uh and it's an interesting thing with hudson as well um because you know from what i've seen of his he's able to describe this contradiction between industrial and finance capitalism right like i think it, I, I don't know if, if this is exactly right, uh, but like it, I think he kind of sees that as like primary, at least in America, where it's like we need to, to um, we need to realize that that um, industrial capitalism is actually progressive. Um, and yeah, um, yeah. and, and um, that's that's a really good insight because that actually reflects uh, factions of the ruling class that are at war with each other. Um, yeah, it actually right? almost directly yeah. correlates to somewhat of the donor structure of the two parties, even where yeah, um, yeah. because like the thing is, is that people um, I've read like Jay, whose criticisms of Hudson is like that Hudson's being like, oh, like oh, so the guys at Exxon Mobil are more progressive than the than uh, the, the the finance people or whatever, and he basically accuses in a, a way that a lot of um these uh like leftists ultra leftists do of um like unproductive labor in the sense of like finance and like you know circulation of capital as being like any criticism of this as being so like sort of occluded anti-semitism or something like he straight up like a cute like says that uh, like jehu has described michael hudson as a, a nazi uh because he th- says that um like banks do not produce uh, surplus value and that they're like not as much of a progressive force as like say like industrial capitalism which also includes you know, like, because because we have this sort of um moralistic sense that, like, you know, oh, the people who are getting oil out of the ground, that's like somehow more evil than someone working at like NGOs and charities. Like, we have this view that, like, like going into the like digging up Mother Earth or whatever. It's like sort of nature fetish, I think. I don't know. Yeah, and 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 that's just I I think like in general this whole nature thing is is reactionary. Um, you know, it's just um, it, it it this this deference towards animals, you know, animal wisdom or whatever. You know, it's completely and it's totally a city person thing too. Like I don't think anyone in the country they don't thinks feel that it's way. Like yeah. That. yeah, at all. So it's just kind of funny. It's like this almost grass is greener type of displacement. Yeah, and the uh, people from the know. cities who go out to the country, they want to make like nature preserves like the audubon society where they can go bird watching and then the people who actually live there they make rod and gun clubs and they want to go shoot those things 
<laughs> so, yeah, and like you know, I wonder. I I feel like I need to read more, understand Marx's explanation of the contradiction between uh, what is it, town and country. Uh, you know, I I, I kind of want to understand how that applies to America. It's a. Uh, it's definitely America is like uh re- like reading or like trying to use Marx to understand a lot of America is also like sort of difficult just because uh, Marx like is making a lot of uh, statements and things that are meant to apply to like a European context and particularly like a continental European context, like um like you know you, when you talk to Americans and they're like well Marx wanted to abolish religion and it's like well Marx said that America had already done that. So he like like what you call religious liberty was what Marx would have called the abolition of religion because like we like they like they don't like understand the historical context like the sort of this juncture between what America was like in let's say the early 19th century and what like continental Europe was like in the early 19th century Um, because like there's also just like the distinctions between like like I don't know there's like just not a lot of historical knowledge right that's right. passed down or considered important in any way. Um, in fact, I would say that the most like historical knowledge that gets transmitted isn't even through like pop culture in the sense of like uh, movies or whatever. Like people would be like, "Oh, you watch like these historical fictions and like films, etc." But like we all kind of ag- know at this point that these things have, are being like very ideologically framed and like kind of warped and like they're, they're not even attempting to like be like, this is a realistic portrayal of this time period, like air an attempt to portray it realistically. Yeah, well, like Hamilton or. Yeah. Know. Yeah. Yeah. They're more like, let's imagine this is more like a myth of history, um, like a fable yeah. of history. Yeah. Everything, everything is Tumblr head cannons now. The, the closest it's, thing you get to that, though, are like these like or like the map game guys, like the guys who play all of these like historical video games where it's actually more about like the systems involved, like, you know, managing the economy of uh, of uh, of whatever of like uh, whatever and like the military strategy, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, you know, and there, there's one aspect to this religious abolition thing that's very important to, to recognize, which is that in America's current atheism, where kind of, you know, for lack of a better term, like capitalist degeneracy is, is running rampant and kind of destroying all culture, like things like, uh, you know, Christian values have actually turned into a progressive force. And uh, uh, a- atheism actually is becoming the reactionary force. And um, I think that's a bit of almost like an eternal uh, I th- with dialectics, people neglect that that dialectics are not something that that it just happens once. It's actually a very cyclical uh, type of thing, you know. Yeah. And I would um, describe it as more yeah. like a spiral because it's not like even a circle yeah, spiral where you return to the same point. It's like you return to a parallel point, uh, but with distance. So it's more like expansive in that way. Um, yeah, cause, yeah, yeah. Because it's like, like uh, the the. It's not like we like people always describe it as like the pendulum swinging or whatever, but it's never actually exactly like that. Because it's like uh, you just see these like weird parallels. It's not like oh, this is like, literally exactly like that. It's like oh, this is akin to that um, in that the the ratio of things is similar or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's funny, and um, you know, like the Larouche stuff is really interesting. Actually, I think about it a lot, even still. Um, and he had this idea of like self-similar spiral action um, at representing um, kind of a human scientific progress. Basically, saying that like first we matter uh, mastered big things, and now we're mastering little things. To put it stupidly, but uh, and and first we had low energy density, like just fire. Now we have high energy density like nuclear and and he kind of believes that that's going to continue uh forever and essentially um but uh it's it's an interesting thing because i think that uh that there's there's a, there's that dialectical spiral in, in a lot of places that that you might not expect it uh it's it's well, really the thing is though that like know. the average like youtube conspiracy guy or whatever will be like oh yeah the sacred geometry or whatever and they'll have fibonacci spirals all the damn time and stuff like that <laughs> You know, and it's like, yeah, like this is kind of how everything works. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, I kind of hate the whole golden ratio thing. I don't, <laughs> I feel like it's overhyped and it's actually part of like this like Roman kind of mysticist type thing because all they, they used it, you know, but it's like, it's, I don't know. <laughs> it's, 
Yeah, but, there uh, is like a degree to which it's like uh, like the worship of like the Renaissance as being like the summit of art or whatever. I think it's it, kind yeah, of lame, and, but and even then, it's nature worship, right? In a way, like mathematics are kind of a, a type of nature worship. Um, so you know, it's yeah. because yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. Um, where they have yeah, like, you know generative artworks that are just like algorithmically produced, and it's like this is like how a plant works, and so there's not really yeah it's not really like um like the sort of abstract art and stuff like that, and yeah, music yeah. and stuff like that like that's become more of like like a I always like like a, like a, the 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 uh, sort of like neo the sort of like neo feudalism like neo fascism sort of that we have is very much like this sort of like libertarian silicon valley conception of like nature worship where it's like there there's these uh uh this that nature is this like system that is like perfect without us that we're kind of like an aberrant thing in nature that like w- like our consciousness basically only contributes to like if it's not just reflecting nature then it's somehow um like an aberration that needs correction yeah and i i think of the 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 this whole notion of the human habitat basically you know like the the planet itself is is something that's being objectified by them um and it's kind of this like acid fueled type of of way of viewing humanity from the top down um and i guess maybe it is kind of looping back to the cult god thing we talked about earlier like it is kind of a similar dynamic but you know it's just kind of this idea that like we need to sit back and be stage managers for the for the human society you know well, like I we think need that's to actually be, yeah. there's actually much more to that than like because um so one of these cult documentaries i watched recently um it was a the i think it was called the the twin flames one if, if anyone has seen that one um there's actually is a point where they have a an active duty like military officer as a higher level person in this uh in this cult doing um sort of like what is effectively brainwashing i forget what they called it it was like mental alignment programming or something like that and um there is like a massive uh, interest in this type of in like uh, cult organizations, so because like they, if you get people in a cult, like you could say like the military is sort of like a cult. You have like this command hierarchy, and um, you can if you keep it keeps people like within certain bounds. Like you can kind of more predict the behaviors of people who are instrumentalized by a cult than you can by like you know. That's why even like you have um like these like FBI stings and things like that where they like you know will like have people going into organizing like radical ra- like radical group chats or whatever is because so long as it's like being surveilled and it's like in a form then it's like can be controlled it's really like uh when things aren't in that structure that uh it's more threatening to uh to you know the uh, powers that be or whatever like yes you can- yeah re- cybernetic control of, of humans you know you see the human mind as a collection of nodes and behaviors and you need to reduce the variety of it right so you give people medications that that reduce the variety of actions they're going to take you give them ideologies that give them these limitations throw them into cults make everything socially unacceptable right like that that's a crazy thing that i realize it's like when I do something that's like, you know, communist organizing and these fucking like, I don't know, like 20 something New York girls go by in their car and roll down the window and laugh at me or something, you know, like this is just this is literally because they've been conditioned to be part of a control mechanism. It has nothing to do with, you know, oh, You're I need targeted to comp- individual. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and yeah. And, and, and so so other people are telling you. Well, that's socially unacceptable. Well, it, you need to ask why, because if it if it's bringing harm to people, if it's causing a problem that doesn't need to exist, uh, then yeah, probably you know. But you know, like I'm not saying we need to just be these antisocial, crazy schizo fuckers, but like yeah, yeah, socially unacceptable. Oftentimes, it literally just means it's something that they don't want you to do. It's something that that they tell people not to do. You shouldn't do this. You shouldn't talk about important issues in public. That's socially unacceptable. You know, you shouldn't you shouldn't uh, get people upset. 
over anything that's wrong in society or pointed out or anything like that. That's socially unacceptable. You know, you're, you're a negative person. Well, what they don't realize is that, no, I'm actually a much more positive person because I know how to get the shit out of me because I'm conscious of it. I see what it is. I can express it. Whereas yeah. they, the other people, they are pretending to be happy, but they have an internal sickness that they refuse to recognize because they, yeah, you, you yeah. just kind of got to accept that the, the sort of irony is like the sort of paradox is like latent in everything. Like, I don't know. Um, I think of constantly when I was in Dallas uh, this one night when I was working at a bar, um, you know, lots of little people working at a bar is like the sort of people who like, you know, microdose mushrooms and are into like all sorts of new age bullshit or whatever. Um, but one day, uh, so it's like the bar scene downtown. And um, this guy was like a street preacher um, just as like walking by with his sign. He wasn't even saying anything. He was just walking walking by with his sign being like repent or whatever the hell, you know, something a street preacher, preacher would have. And, um, this guy who I worked with, he was like, you know, like former meth addict and like, you know, just like, uh, like kind of wacky dude or whatever, but generally like pretty harmless, like just kind of like, not like, not like a scary, frightening person or anything. It doesn't even seem that aggressive, but like, you know, very like courteous and, you know, seemed just kind of like, you know, he had a hard life or whatever. And I, you know, sort of felt bad for him, but I saw him immediately like change, like in his eyes and things. He got so mad at the fact that there was a street preacher there. He like ran away and just started screaming at the guy being like, you can't be here. Like, you can't do this. Like oh, you're doing this fuck up or whatever. And I just like have never understood. Like, I don't understand where that comes from. I feel like it has to be some sort of like tra traumatic like experience or something to like transform like that. Uh, but I can't imagine like, I don't know, like, uh, like going, like getting so mm -hmm. angry at people for differing or like, you know, having a different perspective. Yeah. Is that, that, that often comes from like a person's parents, you know, like they, yeah. they were talking to someone they weren't supposed to, or they, they were yelled at for it. And then th they learned that, you know, I mean, that's, you, you can never truly know, but, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's um, I guess it's, it's important to have this like thing about it, I guess, where you're, you're, how do you say it? You have to, it's, it's hard, you know, because you have to question everything, kind of. You obviously can't question everything or you'd be insane. But, like, you know, you have to put things into question intuitively. But at the same time, you can't, like, um, I don't know how to say it. Like, you can't be the street preacher either. You know what I mean? Like, you have to, you have to find the right, you have to find a way that is, that is going to work, pretty much. I, I don't know. Maybe what the street preacher is doing is working. Maybe I should just be like a Jehovah's Witness sitting on the corner telling everyone about communism. But I feel like that's not the right way. You know, I don't know. I don't really I don't really know what the 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 right way is in, in that sense. Like I'm, I'm more of a uh, uh, just, uh, you know, bear witness, uh, you know, they have patience, uh, just wait. Uh, mostly like I don't really I'm not really an, I'm kind of an anti activist. Like I don't really believe in any kind of activism. Um, I'm kind of like a pacifist, I guess. Like, I don't really, I'm not, I don't want to go do anything, uh, to go out and, uh, preach anything or anything like that. I'm just kind of, a, just kind of trying to, uh, just, uh, maintain, uh, I don't know. There's a, I've been thinking a lot of, uh, the, the concept of forbearance, which is, uh, where you just kind of, um, Leave, you know just leaving things uh, uh giving that giving that up to the uh to, to to the lord really to uh to uh be like that's not in my hands um yeah you know, what, what is the serenity the whole, uh, uh, bless your heart uh southern sort of thing where you just say ah bless your heart <laughs> to, to all the shit yeah yeah i mean and it's easy for, to do that i think because the sphere of activism is so cringy um Right. And they do step over that line. And, uh, you know, I have a mentality of kind of like, well, I actually I having done a lot of this, I find like varying groups have different factions of people, uh, not factions, really, even so much as types of people in them, some of whom are constantly confronting themselves with real questions like what is the actual effect of what we're doing? And those pessimists tend to run away from the group. And then there's people that just feel like I'm a good little boy, or like I'm in debate class in high school or something. And they just don't, you know, they, they, they're naive, and they just keep on doing it autonomously. And they become like a communist like Chris Chan in public, you know, it's not, yeah, it's, it's it's terrible, you know, and I think um, I, in my opinion, like 
basically like this is a this is and this is the contradiction i was talking about earlier with like the nord nerd communists and normal people that could be communists not like not being in contact with each other it's a contradiction that actually you can do things to make it better and what what is the result going to be i don't know if the result is going to be like more effective activism and more activism um i think it's something you have to determine but if you're not determined to bridge that gap which uh logo i think you are doing that through your work here but uh you know if you're not determined to bridge that gap then then what are you doing you know like you're not then you yeah. then you're either doing nothing you're giving up or you're one of the nerds or you're just you know yeah, yeah that's it i sort of you feel know? more like i'm just trying to like i kind of don't really feel like i'm doing any like active promoting of things i just more i'm like uh, I know why these things are wrong. Like, I don't know, like that's really like, and it's mostly from experience or like from having uh, gone through similar thought. Like, I don't know. I just feel more like I am trying to facilitate, like getting to, uh, uh, I, I guess assuaging sort of um, confusion um, about uh, certain things. Cause like, well, you, yeah. you need a lot of rationalizations to explain like why uh, something that is a, paradox is like oh like you know like oh i see uh why is it that the banks are promoting uh socialism or whatever and it's like um like i can explain that and like that was something that i couldn't explain and um but at my ability to explain that like as ultimately was just to satisfy my own uh curiosity and uh my own uh confusion i guess or like being like just feeling like uh i don't know i just felt like bothered by the fact that i didn't understand why things were the way that they are i feel like i do kind of understand why things are the way that they are the sort of rationale of like what's going on in the world um but that was mostly just to satisfy my own uh curiosity and um well, uh, i don't know that's, like, that's I don't fine know i mean that's more to it than that. we we all have varying you know motivations you know there's no i don't think there is anyone with a pure motivation the the key is that when you actually get in it you realize how to purify your motivations in, in a relevant way right because if you were just doing it to satisfy curiosity then you probably would be like one of the thousands of people just kind of uh ranting about this or I, well, I guess you kind of were like that for a while. I, I'm sure you had to start out kind of niche in a way. But like, I guess what I'm saying is there's different terrains, right? Like, so you're doing this on the internet terrain. I'm not apparently and maybe I, maybe that'll change but apparently i'm not so good at doing this on the internet terrain so i tend to like do like irl activism which it was really funny because to people on the internet like they they don't know what to make of it like some people hate me uh some people they just um you know it, it, it's kind of it's kind of funny you know like i don't come into this type of space a lot and i don't know if i intend to keep doing it or not it's actually a really nice day outside so i'm probably gonna head out in a moment but um, yeah I, w I wanted to wrap this up soon too but it's been nice talking to you i mean we we got to cover a lot of different uh subjects and stuff so i thought that was um interesting um i don't think i've talked yeah. to you before i like having people on that i haven't talked to before so i've come on briefly actually uh to i wanted to get your critique of a, a cpi conference that was held oh, I think right. a year or two ago but uh yeah you know it's been it's been really good um i'm really glad how this turned out i think we're on the same like wavelength so you know i'll probably be yeah. back in the future so uh yeah good talking to you logo yeah well uh, peace out everyone uh have a good day bye bye